Friday morning, approximately like shortly after midnight, because we drop these things right at midnight now, because Reed wants to get a jump on everyone else. Oh, wow. I like to keep it fresh and hot out of the oven. Welcome to the Markcast. Thank you for joining us here for another episode. Uh, Reed, what's going on, man? Uh, are we, what is clout and are we chasing it? Uh, we're not chasing clout, sir, but the people that are in our mentions on our verified accounts, like they, they get clout. They like think they're getting clout for like, you know, hitting us up on Twitter and saying, oh, look at how I own these verified accounts and calm down. We're not chasing clout though. Well, I do. Cause I don't, you, you famously are, are older than I am, but I also feel like you are more hip to like the lingo, right? Like Braden said, T-I-L the other day. I had to Google that. I didn't know what T-I-L meant. Today I learned. I didn't know what that meant. You didn't know what that meant? No, I didn't know what that meant. But uh, I just, like, I, yeah, I did. I don't know. I mean, we're, I feel like we're, uh, I think, you know, <laughs> I think the 40 hours a week, we, we've, I was sitting there the other night, you know, answering YouTube comments. I'm like, I feel like I'm working pretty hard if this is, I don't know what cloud is or what I'm chasing, but I just feel like we're, we are working hard. So I don't think, I don't think you're, ch- we're chasing cloud in a sense like, we don't argue just to like go, oh, look, look at what I did to the, the so-and-so. Look at, look at, and they, they take screenshots of their tweets and they, they want people to gas them up. And I mean, gassing up means, you know, like giving them props and like making the, you know, it's like you gas up your friends. If they're feeling down, you tell them like things maybe that might kind of not be true to can make them feel better and give them like a self-esteem boost. So you get people gassing up other people like last night. Uh, no, two nights ago, I should say now that's technically Friday, two nights ago, you know, you had one guy that had like 50 followers, but yet his engagements were through the roof on things he was saying to me. I'm like, okay, you're just, you're just going for clout here. You're passing your little tweets around in your little group chats. And that's, that's basically what I mean. Like you go for clout because you say things that you don't necessarily believe with to get to be popular. Okay. That's, that's the way I look at it. Oh, no, I just, I, I, I saw that we were accused of uh, just with CFL stuff. We're trying to like get get in on things and i'm like i feel like we're doing the work i feel like um that's anyway that was that was my thing about that uh you you had mentioned in our interview with steve simmons that we just did tremendous interview uh, that i looked concerned i think uh so i have a tooth issue going on i currently have and so i feel like i sound different today dorothy says i sound the same i feel like i sound different uh, we might be going through, I, I broke my tooth, Paul, is what I did, is I actually uh, fell, I actually broke my front tooth, uh, wonderful story, but right now I have a bar holding it in place. So if I look concerned, if I'm like licking my teeth, if I'm, and, and, and ultimately I may lose this tooth and then they will have a whole cosmetic change. But anyway, if I look concerned, if I sound weird uh, over the next couple of weeks, I just feel like I have a lisp, kind of lisp going on with my bar in my mouth. I don't hear it, but I'll, I'll pay attention more or less, you know, you and me having problems with our teeth. Now we're the Spider-Man pointing, pointing, yes. pointing gift. That's what we are. Yeah. That's what we are. Uh, so also, uh, uh, the wife and I are, are, we're taking a little R and R to Vegas. I don't know if we have any Vegas <laughs> listeners. If you're a Vegas listener and you want to go grab a drink here, uh, I'll be in Vegas over the, I'm not going to say exact dates, but I'll be in Vegas over the next coming weekend. So if we have any Vegas, li- I have no idea if we have any Vegas listeners. I know we have like, you know, Jenna's in California I know we have Max in Texas. I know we have Zach over in, in St. Louis, but, uh, anyway, if we have any Vegas listeners, I just I'm throwing that out there and, and hang out with me and my bum tooth hey, and and your wife as well um let's uh, let's also let's also hope for good vibes that the vegas golden knights pull off a miracle and come back for for my sanity and you know because they're you know they're my second favorite team after the devils and of course reed wants to attend a stanley cup final game which would be really cool if you get to do that i've done that before so it's awesome are they playing tonight though as we record um, I think they're playing tonight. I I think we'll know. So. So you should know. Like <laughs> maybe we'll this know. is all dated. Maybe <laughs> yeah, at this point, you know, there's yeah. no uh there, yeah, they're playing tonight. Uh 5 p.m. Well, Pacific time. Good, good vibes. So, good vibes rolling. Let's 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 be optimistic. You'd be optimistic. Uh a couple other quick things and then we'll plug all the stuff. Uh we I set up we did this all and then I think you had to go out of town. I set up a whole offers page. If you are someone that likes to support the show, wants stuff, we have an Amazon link. You can buy your Amazon stuff, use our code. We get, you know, it's like a tip jar thing. Uh we also have all the manscape links on there. We'll talk about and Paul's uh uh blow the the stress reliever. I can never pronounce it. It's a Kumoso. Kumos Kumoso. Kumoso. 
Uh, anyway, we have best me or uh, not best me. That's my uh, wow. the markcast.com slash offers. We have all our offers on there, and there's like in you all the stuff you would normally get, like on Amazon, all these things. But if you do it through there, we get so if you want to support, you know, again, we 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 don't plug our merch a lot. The markcast.com slash merch, you can get merch. I got I, ha- I ordered a shirt that's coming because I realized I have a manscape shirt, but I don't have a markcast shirt, so I, I, I did order that. but Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, you know, or leave a review, the markcast.com slash review. Uh, please subscribe, you know, uh, a lot of work today and, and, and um, things that we're doing. But anyway, yeah, the markcast.com slash offers. I thought that was good. And we also have more uh, partnerships coming down the line that uh, that I'm that I'm working on currently setting up a sports memorabilia shop is going to is going to come on and, you know, and 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 provide some great discounts and some great signed and autographed merchandise and some collectibles. So we got a lot of things going on. If you want to support the show please 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 click those affiliate links order yourself a, a manscaped uh lawnmower 4.0 or any of the other products you know of course 20 percent off use the code uh markcast Mar- uh markcast at uh i got two different podcasts i'm like yeah. uh, it's like a, it's like a competing battle in my brain but of course markcast the code to use 20 percent off at manscaped yeah. Anyway, we don't. I don't like to. I. I rather would just talk about my broken teeth at the top of the show. But I do think we need to plug everything every once in a while. Uh, good show today. We got all the big C two one eight stuff, all the player retirements, and then there's all this big XFL. The players didn't get paid bankruptcy stuff. I have. We have everything coming up. Uh, Nick Solsky, he is the chief uh, commercial officer at Points Bet Canada. A great interview. He's heading up. His phone was melting yesterday or two days ago, he said, with all the single-game sports betting and all the teams uh, reaching out. So uh, Nick's going to come on. Uh, Paul, what did you think of our chat with Hall of Famer Steve Simmons? It was really good. Um, um, you know, it was really... It was kind of like, I like to think of like, Arash light where he was, you know, he was kind of very critical in a, in a, in a very, um, non dismissive way, if that makes sense. Like he's very critical of the XFL, which, you know, we're definitely people that accept criticism of the product that we started this whole, this whole podcast following, um, you know, when we criticize the other side, you know, that's when, that's when things get crazy and people go for clout and try to take us out but um it was it was a very enlightening com- a conversation with steve and uh yeah just stay tuned for that one yeah steve's good and then uh, this is kind of some bonus spring league stuff jackson leonard he's a listener of the show longtime fan he played in the vegas showcase you know two spring leagues ago and then he was in san antonio at the alamo dome jackson's got uh you know stories about brian woods thoughts on the usfl stuff yes. and so i really appreciate uh him reaching out and, and we kind of went back and forth and so jackson's going to be on later in the show in the kind of the spring league section so i, re- I appreciate his time as well very cool. Very good stuff. So the big story this week, of course, C two one eight that that passed. It's it basically. Long story short, you don't have to do parlays anymore. You can have a single game sports bet. Um, that's now federal law in Canada. Yeah, it, it, the thing about it too is because uh, it was a private members bill. I guess it, very low odds of those ever passing. Um, Kevin Wo, uh, he was kind of the, the signee on it. Uh, he he his quote that I had bolded here. He goes, "One general manager of a team and president said to me from the CFL, this is as big as television back in 1954. The magnitude of single sports betting in this country uh, can be dated back to the 50s, almost 60 plus years ago. So uh, you know, like." <laughs> which is uh listener max it was funny because he messaged me and he goes yeah but uh the, the remember how everyone complains about the tv deal for the cfl but this is just as big <laughs> I'm like yeah because it's anyway to me um we get in with it with steve we get in with, with, with nick uh it still feels I, I i think if you are someone that bets this is good you i don't think you are going to attract many people that don't bet already to watch the CFL. Paul, what are your thoughts? You gamble a lot more, not a lot more, but I mean you gamble more than I do on sports. Well, first and foremost, not gambling if you know you're going to win. <laughs> Second of all, um I think that there's been an increase like um there was there's been a stigma attached to gambling. There's a stigma attached to anything that's illegal um you know across the board in the in in the United States like I, I won't get too political, I won't get like marijuana legislation, for example, you know, there, there was a stigma attached to that. And now like, you know, almost half the States have legal marijuana for, um, for recreational use and, you know, more than half now have it for medical use. So basically what it boils down to is like, 
now that things are destigmatized, I think you've seen the growth of gambling in the United States. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, that's what they're hoping for up there in Canada is that now there's now there's not a you know a stigma attached to it. And you're going to have, uh, like Steve uh, c- came on and talked about, you know, you're going to have a draft Kings potential place in, you know, CFL stadiums to go uh, place a bet. And, and maybe that's, 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 that'll help it. But I don't think that, you know, like, you know, there's no silver bullet that's, that's going to solve this thing. It's, it's got to be a, a variety of things all at once. And it seems like there's just this one track. Oh, this will fix it. This will fix it as opposed to a variety of things like a football game from EA sports or something that might, you know, help. Yeah, I don't know. To me, the, the big scary thing with this is in Nick talks, uh, you know, this is going to be up to the provinces. It's going to be up to the teams. And so Nick and we get into it in the interview, but you know, certain teams have reached out and that's where it gets scary to me. Cause it's like, so then you're going to have like maybe Edmonton's really up on it and they're going to be utilizing it. And it goes back to the same problems we've always had, right? Where some of the teams are more successful. Some of the more populated teams aren't as successful, you know, the community owned teams and whatever. And so, it still feels, um, you know, it still feels messy. And I, I asked Nick, I'm like, is this something where it, it, there's so much money involved that the CFL literally just needs to get out of the way and let all of these smart people and marketers do their job? And I kind of think that's what it is, right? Is it's like just CFL, like shut up and, and go, like just let us bet and let us run all these things. Cause you know, like Nick with, with points bets, you know, they, they, they do this, right? This is all they do. And so coming in and uh, I feel like they can, you know, they're ready to set up this infrastructure. Like they just needed to go ahead, but I do worry. Like I, it, this just feels like a lot of heavy lifting to me for the CFL. So I completely agree with you all, all there. Speaking of heavy lifting for the CFL, nice little segue there. Uh, wow. A lot of retirements going down, a lot of retirements happening right now. Um, notable names include like uh, Brad Sinopoli. Hopefully I'm Sinopoli. pronouncing that correct. Um, and, uh, Jalen Saunders, I guess is, is now not playing because of the car crash. Um, he was, uh, Sinopoli on that note was uh, scheduled to earn 150,000, 150,000, yeah. 160,000, 160,000 in 2021. I got to get new glasses now. Um, and I guess, uh, for him, it wasn't really like a, you know, a lack of money. It was just like taking care of his health. I mean, do you really want to, you know, we've, we've, we've heard so much about CTE coming out in the, the, you know, the most recent years about, you know, these, these gladiators essentially banging heads and, you know, causing issues later down in life is $160,000 really worth it. You know, taking care of his health was a priority. Yeah. It's a, yeah. The, the Brad Sinopoli one was a big deal. You know, he was kind of one of the big yeah. uh, star receivers. It's interesting. You know, we had talked about Jalen a couple of weeks ago. He was in that horrendous car accident. So it's like, I mean, the red blocks, people are like, they're out for the season. I mean, they, you know, two of their star players are, are down. Yeah. What's crazy to me is, you know, we talk about the low pay of the CFL players sometimes. Yeah. 160,000. It's nothing to sneeze at. And he had some signing bonuses and stuff. And so like, that's a sizable paycheck to walk away from. He's still going to be involved in the red blacks, uh, like in the organization. What was really interesting, uh, the riders defensive lineman, Chad Jeter retired. He's going to join the air force, but what was so interesting to me. He was on Rob Peterson's show this week talking about how so many of these players, obviously we, we know, okay, maybe they got jobs, you know, they've been off for 16 months, all these things. But the story that he told is when I'm living, you know, the six months out of the year, if I'm going up to play in the CFL, I'm still paying my mortgage in the States. A lot of these players, you know, still paying the mortgage right. in the States. Maybe you've got a wife and kids. Maybe you've got a partner or whatever, you know, you're doing these things. Then you're also paying to live up in Canada, right? You got to get an apartment somewhere. Maybe you got to rent a car. You got to buy your groceries up there. And so he's like, you're almost, you know, playing two lives. You're living two lives during this time period. And then the money is so low anyway, right? For a lot of these guys. And so, you know, that coupled with, you know, being off for 16 months, you know, getting other jobs and things, just that idea of like, well, I, now I've got to go like, I couldn't imagine that, like having, that's why like, I don't have a studio, you know, I work from home because I don't want to have like another mortgage on top of what I'm doing. That makes sense. Totally. Um, and we wish him the best of luck. He's joining, you know, he's joining the air force and, uh, we're, we're, we're happy that he's going to serve his country, um, and, you know, defend our freedoms and, you know, protect us. Another retirement, uh, Edmonton Elks, Derek Dennis is stepping away, um, I guess, you know, that uh, football doesn't provide the opportunity. His quote is uh, football no longer provides the opportunity to be able to care for his family properly. 
Uh, so in all facets. So for that reason, he'll not be playing in the upcoming season. Yeah, that's a big, you know, that, that struck a lot of people that it's basically like, you know, the, I mean, lack of a better word, you know, the money and everything isn't enough. You know, we talked, like I said, the Chad Jeter story, you know, uh, playing up there, you know, everyone thinks, oh, you're this big football star. Well, it's a six month gig. You know, you're getting paid a fraction of what you're getting paid. And yeah, I mean that that that's sad. Uh, I know that you know a lot of these guys are are fan favorites, and you know uh, there's been a lot of questions about like what are these teams going to look like uh, come this year? And and it is, I think people are going to be really shocked. You know the the players that are in the helmets, and and you know are you going to recognize a lot of these teams with a lot of these guys going? Taylor Loftner uh, retired as well. Uh, he was oh, he wasn't signed to a team right now. He was out on injury. There's a ton of like these are just kind of some of the ones that I uh, organized together. I know there were a ton this week, and if your favorite player wasn't on there, I apologize. These were kind of the ones, especially the Brad Sinopoli one was was a big deal uh, in terms of like star mega star power with like a contract that walked away. Are there, Paul? Sorry, I, I, my, my brain froze for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> I zoned out. Um, yeah, a lot of retirements. Um, again, you know, we, we've, we've raised this concern before. Where we're like, huh, I wonder, you know, I wonder how many people are actually going to come back. I mean, the, the pandemic probably prioritized a lot of things for a lot of players not making the kind of money that they make, you know, down here in the NFL. And, you know, that's, that's another concern that we always bring up when it comes to the CFL stuff. Uh, speaking of more concerns, Saskatchewan Rough Riders report a $7.5 million loss in, uh, in 2020 and 2021 for uh, not playing last year. Uh, Rough Riders President Craig Reynolds says, it's our biggest financial loss we've ever had in the club's history. It's going to be a multi-year challenge, and that's another reason why uh, I think this is the biggest crisis we face, because it will now really affect three years. And I think it's optimistic that it's just going to affect three years. But, you know, what do you think, Reed? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, the one thing about this is, you know, they had to refund some of their season ticket sales, but then they're carrying over the ten million in ticket sales from last year to this year, and so that's also revenue you're not going to get right. And in the wedding industry, we dealt with this um, last summer where we had a lot of canceled weddings. Right, everyone moved their weddings to this year, and that was something I talked a lot about. I do my wedding podcast. Is we're basically living two years off of one season of revenue, right? And this is very much a lot of these CFL teams are going to be going through the same thing where any of that, you know, and the Rough Riders aren't alone in this, right? I mean, this is just the the most recent one that posted their losses, but carrying over a lot of these things, you're not getting that money this year as well now. And so uh, they had to go, they had um, quite a, quite a cash cow. I know like the Edmonton team has a cash, kind of a cash reserve too. And they're really going to have to dig into that. And they said also that um, some of the other quotes in the article was uh, they got some wage subsidies from the government, you know, so they didn't get, you know, the CFL didn't get any of those big loans, but a lot of the teams got um, like PPP loan kind of like things to keep some of the, some of their people, the staff and stuff involved. So. Very cool. Um, I'm not, not very cool. It's, that's unfortunate. I, didn't know why. No, I said very cool there. Um, <laughs> good reporting, uh, Reed. <laughs> very good cool. reporting, Reed. <laughs> Way to be on it. Uh, writers, uh, writers head coach Craig Dickinson uh, predicts surprise cuts. Warns unprepared players are not going to last training camp. And uh, I guess his, uh, I guess his, um, his thought process is that they're not going to be in shape. Maybe. Yeah. Is that is that yeah. where is that where he's going with this? Yeah, they're, they're not. And, you know, it, this was kind of the big thing last week at the end of the I think this I think this quote came out on Friday, but it kind of carried over to this week where you have a lot of people saying, like, we'll just go, go to the gym. I go to the gym. Can't you go? And it's like, no, like to be, to be in football shape is, is not to be in like, oh, I'm I'm in cardio shape. Like I went and we've talked about this before, you know, being in, in like ring shape for WWE is very different than being in like, okay, I'm fit. You know, look at the rock uh, famously, the rock, you know, owner of the XFL. I, uh, when he trained to come back at WrestleMania in what was it? Orlando and Miami against Cena, mm-hmm. you know, he had, you know, was in the best shape of his life. And he came out to the ring and like five minutes in, you know, he was totally gassed, couldn't whatever. Well, it's these football guys, right? You know, you can, they're still working. They're still taking care of their family. And then they're trying to like stay in, you know, somewhat shape, but then to get back in football shape, that's a huge commitment. And it is They're They're saying that there's going to be a lot of these guys that either don't want to, or aren't able or don't, but I don't think that that's a criticism more of like, this is just a terrible situation that they're in, you know? I mean, that's that that goes to like kind of like 
you know, these, these players had to find jobs over the last two years. And maybe they're also looking like, man, I was working, you know, I don't know. I don't know the Canadian work weeks. I know that we, they work us here 40 hours a week minimum in other countries. It's like, you know, 20 to 24 hours a week. And you, you have a, you have a great, uh, living, work you know, balance. great quality of life in, in other countries. Um, and I don't know if it's like a 40 hour a week thing up there in Canada, but you know, all these players are probably looking at like, I work 40 hours a week. I don't really have time to take four or five hours and get in football shape. That's also, that's also probably why there's some concerns about a lot of these people not making it through training camp. Yeah. And I don't blame the players. I blame the circumstances because it, yeah, it's exactly. impossible. You know, it's not a, it's not a criticism. I mean, it's, it's literally impossible to work a 40 hour week or whatever, and then also spend five hours a day at the gym. I mean, it's just not, so I don't, it's not like a criticism or a poo poo. It's like, there's only so many hours in the day, you know, that's very true. Uh, Craig Dickinson also, uh, kept talking about how, um, this is great. I love this. They're winging it. They're winging they're it. They're winging it. And he said, uh, the closest parallel to what they're doing with the winging through the winging the season is, uh, kind of like the lockout that wiped out the NHL season back in 2004, 2005. And, um, I guess, uh, what, what he's, what he's talking about is like, there was a whole complete, no, like one year hockey didn't get played and it cost NHL TV deals. Like ESPN didn't, I, I, I believe that's when the ESPN did not renew their deal with NHL and they had to take a lesser deal with NBC. Um, that's now been corrected because, you know, the NHL is starting to gain again in popularity. Um, but Dickinson said, I don't know any of these NHL coaches. They'd probably refuse my call if I called them. And um, he said that they basically like the football stuff, it's going to be, you know, they, they can get the football play, but it's like, how, you know, how are we going to deal with these guidelines? How are we going to get everything going? I mean, you know, Rod said on his show, you know, I mean, they, they say that we're close to the starting or the, uh, are we close to the finish line or are we still very far away from the starting line? I mean, this is a lot of work still to be done. I mean, we're, we're June 24th, 25th, as you listen to this, but you know, training camp started in, in, in two weeks. Uh, you know, we we're getting some uh, beat reporters scheduled to come on to talk about those, but it will be interesting once the players, cause you know, everyone's kind of in quarantine right now, uh, how that's going to look. Uh, the big, the big concern now for us traveling up for the gray cup, um, I'm pretty sure we'll get everything under control, Canada, before this happens. Uh, Justin Trudeau is resisting the pressure from businesses to open the U.S. border for summer. Of course, a lot of people love to go up to Canada in the summer. It's beautiful for those few weeks um, that you have a great, great, great summer. I'm not trying to disparage your lovely country. Um, but, uh, you know, that, uh, that basically the border chief announced an extension of the current border rules that shut down the border uh, until at least July 21st. Read. Did you have any plans to go to Canada this year or just <laughs> Well, we're going to, we're trying to go to BC here in the middle of October. So, I mean, we still got a little bit away, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously those players going up are going to get, you know, exemption, quarantining, whatever things, but uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're still, uh, we, we were the problem for a long time. The U S was the problem for a long time and no one wanted they, us to come. They shut down their border to us and now they've kept their border shut down to keep them out of here. It's, it's, it's interesting how it's flipped. I, you know, I do still think like, I still believe in the exemption thing. Like I've had my second vaccine for how many months now I should be able to go up there and be like, Hey, I'm vaccinated and I'm cool. Like, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just being completely, um, I guess, aggressive with wanting to go to Canada. I always, I, I've told you this. I want to be like Wayne's world with our, with, with like the VIP card going through like, Oh, we're good. We're good. We're good. You know, like, like multi-pass. Um, <laughs> uh, Saskatchewan premier Scott Moe uh, was at empty. It was at an empty mosaic stadium on Sunday in Saskatchewan uh, to let the, to let the people know that they've received the key COVID-19 vaccination requirements. Of course, isn't Saskatchewan doing great with their vaccine Fantastic. numbers? Also, like the least one of the least populated there is, but right. they're killing it. But that's the thing is because it, the, the numbers are great there. But it's, you got to go, you got to go everywhere, but they're, they're yep. talking and this relates to our next story too, with the bombers and the, and the riders. But yeah, he wants to fill it. He says, uh, three weeks from today on Sunday, the 11th, uh, they're going to be no more, no more limits. You know, we're, we're full open back again. So it's exciting. Best of luck with that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that, that means that, you know, 
interstate travel, inter inter provincial provincial travel doesn't you know bring their numbers up again in Saskatchewan, so they can keep everything open and get a full stadium. Uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Speaking of Saskatchewan, they're discussing the idea of joint practices during training camp to prepare for the 2021 CFL season. Uh, Regina is, of course, just a six-hour drive from Manitoba, and um, you know. It's Let's way see, better. You know, it's way better in Saskatchewan right now to be doing all this, you know, to be yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, with, you know, if you're doing joint practices, you know, there's, there's the, the, the idea that you can go full speed a little bit better than you would on your own teammates. And that kind of, you know, like how we brought up the concerns about the NFL, not having the preseason games and it kind of led to a lot of injuries. Um, and, and it, for lack of a better term, I mean, look what happened to the NBA. The off season was so short in the NBA this year, a lot of people got injured like Kyrie and James Harden and cost the Brooklyn Nets a title. But I digress. Um, you know, the idea that they can go full speed and get in game speed by practicing with another team is a great idea. Yeah, uh, we last week, the Elks were uh, I can't remember the Elks and the Stampede or someone. They were anyway, there was a couple of these different teams were talking and, and uh, Jim Mullen had brought up in the scheduling. Remember that, you know, BC Lions are kind of out on an island. So I don't know if they're, you know, maybe there'll be uh, four sets of joint practices and then them out on their own. I think the, the first couple of weeks of the CFL are going to be fascinating with no preseason and no like off for 16 months. And uh, I think Donk on his thing, he's like. Oh, I think it's going to be fascinating. Like the players are going to be so well rested. I'm like, yeah, there's there's a thing to be like too well rested. Like if I haven't played football in 16 months and I'm coming back on the field, like that's a long off season. You know? Yep. Jeremy O'Day said we're exploring right now to see if there's a potential for this joint practice to happen. It'd be great from an evaluation and standpoint to see our guys competing against another team. And it's happening all pretty fast. So. Cool. We're going to take a break, uh, you know, do the commercial thing. Going to come back, going to talk to Nick Solsky and Steve Simmons right after this. Well, Nick Solsky, I got I got you. If you're chief commercial officer at Points Bets Canada, uh, formerly of Monkey Knife Fight, thank you so much for coming on and, and kind of working this out and going through all the proper channels. Uh, how are you doing so far? It, an exciting week. I'm tired, man. I'm tired. It's been an exciting week. It's been an exciting few weeks. It's been an exciting month, an exciting year. I mean, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, I, I think that, 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 um, you know, I joined points bet Canada as, as employee number one, officially, I think around three weeks ago. And then yesterday, as, as you know, bill C218, uh, passed the Senate. Uh, there's one last thing left, which is Royal assent, you know, the governor general signing it, but, uh, that's more ceremonial than anything else. So with that, it, it kind of clears the way for single event sports betting in Canada, which I mean, it's about time. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think, I think yesterday around three forty-five, my phone began to melt, which is an interesting feeling, you know, when you're literally my phone was heating up, which was kind of exciting. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's exciting times. I mean, it's exciting times for a Canadian sports fan. It's exciting times for a, for a Canadian sports gaming operator, for, for a Canadian sports brand. Um, I think it's just an exciting time for, for Canadians, you know? Uh, yeah, th this worked out because, you know, obviously we had kind of gone back and forth with getting you on. And then um, we have always just kind of operated that this was going to pass, moving ahead with it. But it really worked out serendipitously that kind of this all this came down this week. Uh, I was reading a quote today, and we're going to talk about it on the podcast, that this is as big a step as the CFL getting the TV deals and stuff back in the 50s, right? Like, how big of a deal is this for the CFL? It's paramount to, I believe, the uh, long-term prospects of the league. I mean, the CFL... Um, for years has relied on, on the gate. Um, the TV deals obviously are massive, but, um, the gate w w has been key to the league and let's face it during the pandemic. I mean, that's a significant amount of money that was lost because there were no fans in the stands. There really aren't any other significant new revenue streams that are going to come to the table for the league. So, the passing of C218, what that does is it provides an opportunity for the CFL to actually begin working alongside the best 
regulated legal sports gaming operators in North America. Whereas up until now, um, as you're probably aware, you know, the CFL has been working with some of the gray market operators. Um, the additional revenues that are now going to come to the table, both from a league perspective and from a team perspective, um, and from an additional engagement perspective are going to be extraordinarily tangible. I mean, let's face it, you, you know, people don't think of, of the impact of C218 and single event sports betting um, uh, with the big picture in mind. All they see is, oh my gosh, that's going to add some tax revenues. That's going to add money for the sports leagues. But what it's also going to do is, you know, my belief, I mean, I'm a gaming operator, so the consumer protections and the responsible gaming aspects are, to me, the most important things. But that that's not necessarily going to impact someone like yourself. The content creators now are going to um, see the extraordinary benefit of what the enhanced engagement around CFL games is going to bring to them, their sites, their content. So there's going to be uh, an escalation of jobs in the in, in the Canadian sports industry, both by way of operators. Points Bet Canada, case in point, I'm employee number one. Points Bet Canada is the only operator today um, who is launching and building a distinct Canadian business and distinct operating team. So we will be hiring a significant amount of Canadians. Um, other operators will probably build smaller teams, but that's fine. Media companies are going to need to hire gaming experts to handle sponsorship opportunities and the content, the data. Um, that's going to trickle down to the leagues and the teams. There's going to be a, there's now a, now a whole new category of sponsorship um, in inflow that uh, teams and organizations are going to have to deal with. And then from a content perspective, hey, sports gambling content is going to be prominent, as it should be. You want to educate the consumer on how to bet responsibly. You want to educate the consumer on, on, on how to bet um, you know, uh, confidently. But at the same time, I think now the consumer is going to be even more excited to in to to engage with that content, to dive into that content, you know, you're. I, I think we're going to see um, a, a significant growth in just the overall engagement of of the Canadian sports fan and the Canadian football league fan. And let's face it, from a broadcaster perspective, people are going to watch games longer, right? I mean, a game could be a blowout, but if you have a, a few bucks riding on it, you're going to watch it you're going to watch till the end, right? So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a big question, but, I mean, the impact of C218 is massive. And, and let me just end with this. Like, and I speak personally, I'm a father. Uh, my daughter uh, plays, plays flag football. She loves football. Um, I think that the impact of the passing of C218 and the amount of additional revenue that's going to flow into the sports landscape as a whole is going to trickle down to grassroots and amateur sports, and it's going to provide a stronger foundation for the growth of the Canadian sports landscape as a whole. My daughter playing flag football will be positively impacted by the legalization of sports gambling because there's going to be more money in the ecosystem, and it's going to trickle down, and it's going to be operators like Points Bet Canada who keep that and have that in mind and understand that it's not just about generating bets from customers. It's about building a better holistic experience for the sports fan. Um, and that's really what I think, uh, that's what, well, that's what excites me. Sorry. I, I talk no, a lot. That's good. A good question, man. <laughs> that's it. This works well for the podcast. Uh, the biggest, uh, concern for us and, and my co-host Paul to all echo, you know, and, and this is people have told us this, right. You know, we come into covering the CFL stuff and people have said, you know, uh, the league struggles to know how to market, right. For the last couple decades, you know, they, they've really fallen behind where, you know, the NFL, NHL, a lot of these other major leagues, but then the same people that are telling us that now are saying, 
man, when it comes to sports betting, you know, the CFL, the marketing potential is just out the roof, right? And so I'm like, well, how are those, you know, this, this league that maybe is more of a dinosaur, is it one of those things where this is so big that the CFL almost just needs to get out of the way and everybody else that's smarter around them can run this stuff? You know what I mean? Like you guys can handle it. Like how does that, I just, that's where we struggle with, with the mindset around this. I mean, it, it, it's a really good question. And, you know, I think that, um, I will say that the CFL has been spending a lot of time thinking about the reality of C218. Not to not to call them out, but I, you know, I, I I consider their chief marketing officer and chief revenue officer, Tyler Mazaro, I consider Ty Tyler a friend. And I know how long he's been thinking about what the impact of C218 could mean in the marketing activities of the CFL. So I think I think. It's. I don't think it's right to think of the CFL as a dinosaur when it comes to their marketing initiatives in relation to the rollout of sports betting. I think that the CFL um, understands that there are experts within this digital marketing and, or digital sports gaming marketing realm that they're also going to be able to uh, tap into now. Hey, Points Bet Canada. Or here, um, you know, I don't want to speak self-servingly, but let's face it. Now that sports betting is going to be rolled out in Canada, there are some extraordinarily savvy digital marketing experts that are going to become a part of these activations alongside leagues like the CFL. So I don't think the CFL is thinking about this in a vacuum. And they're definitely not thinking about this like, you know, 2014 or just to throw out a random year in the past. I I think that what we're going to see is a level of new creativity when it comes to how the, the, the legalization of single event sports betting can be applied to the marketing efforts of the CFL to grow the league, right? I mean, ultimately... That's everyone's desire is I believe that, and I won't speak for everyone, but I believe that the, that single event sports betting in Canada is going to help grow sport, period, right? CFL, CHL, NHL, I mean, CHL is a little bit tricky because it's, it's junior, like it's younger kids, but, you know, NBA in Canada, MLB, like, and then most importantly, some of the smaller sports, right? Or some of the the non-classic for North American sports, golf is going to be big. Tennis is going to be big. You know, there's a bunch of massive opportunities, I think, that are going to strike the Canadian market. But when it comes to the Canadian Football League specifically, I think that they are going to be able to bring to the table a unique um, integration of what sports betting and their brand, uh, you know, will 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 you know, bring together to the market. So, yeah, I don't think we can uh, assume that the, uh, you know, their former marketing tactics are going to be applied in the future. Uh, Is this one of the things, are we going to feel the ramifications of this immediately this season, next year? I mean, how long realistically is it going to take to, for the average, you know, someone that's just watching, you know, the Rough Riders or whatever to, to experience all this? Well, C218, C218 passed the Senate yesterday. It'll get signed hopefully tomorrow. Now, you know, you, you look at the media right now, everyone's like, sports gambling is legal. Yeah. Single event sports gambling is legal. It's not. It's not. It's not. Um, which is an advantage for the gray market operators, full stop, because now Canadians are just assuming that sports betting is legal. And now they don't mind sending their money off to Curacao or China, and they don't really understand that that's what they're doing. But regardless, let me step back. Um, Sports betting in Ontario, which will most likely be the first province to roll out, Ontario optimistically will will launch by the end of of, of this year, by the end of 2021. It will most likely launch after the CFL season. So the CFL currently has a deal with a gray market operator. Um, A number of teams have deals with, with, with operators that are operating in Canada currently, uh, not under regulation. So I think the expectation from a CFL fan um, would be similar to what the experience is like 
as an NHL fan who's watching the Stanley Cup Finals right now. I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan. Um, go Habs, go. You're going, I would be yeah. wearing this right now, but this is a football hat, right? <laughs> and I am wearing a football hat, by the way. This is a, this is a, a, a hat supporting my, my good friend Scott Fish, who runs like the biggest fantasy football <laughs> league. Anyway, um, so if you're watching the Stanley Cup Finals, um, you're seeing lots of ads for these gray market operators basically pushing to .NET sites, which is free to play. And I won't, you're not allowed to get me started on the hypocrisy of .NET marketing in Canada. Um, you see on the ice, you see a number of logos or, or you know, calls to action of gray market operators. You're going to see the same thing, in my opinion, most likely with the CFL broadcast. Again, we're day one after the passing of C2A team, so it's very early. Um, but that's my expectation in 21 is to basically see something very similar to what we've been seeing with the Stanley Cup uh, or the NHL playoffs. I think come 22, it'll be interesting to see how uh, the teams, and I will say within the last, what time is it now? Within the last 16 hours, I've been approached by three uh, CFL teams, um, which is great, Yeah. right? Yeah. So I think that there are going to be some proactive CFL teams um, and potentially the league um, that decides that they do want to partner and work with the, the most legitimate, regulated, compliant operators, because ultimately we are going to provide the best platform, the best product, the best service. Um, Point Spec Canada, obviously I'm biased. We are going to be the only operator um, you know, outside of there's one other that we will both know, but you know, the score was founded in Canada. We, uh, you know, I have my own opinions about how we will uh, inhabit this market alongside them. But I believe that Point Spec Canada, being a standalone Canadian operator, operating on top of the best product in the world, in my opinion from a sports betting um, platform perspective, points bet. One of the reasons, just so you know, candidly, one of the reasons why I was so excited to join points bet and to be employee number one for points bet Canada is because points bet has built a best in class product. They built their own tech stack. They operate their own tech stack. They understand the necessity to have boots on the ground in markets that they're going to launch in. They're an Australian company. They launched in the U S and grown exponentially since that launch uh, about 19 months ago, and we're going to replicate that success in Canada. So I believe that leagues like the CFL and and teams like the ones that approached uh, us uh, over the last day understand that it's not just about money. Straight up, it's not just about money. If 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 leagues and teams want to create true partnerships and want to create really strong, authentic bridges and connect connections to their fans, they're going to want to partner with the most compliant, the most um, safe, uh, and the most Canadian operators that they can. Because ultimately, let's face it, one of the things that you and I both love about the Canadian Football League is what? So uniquely Canadian, right? Like a, a, a fan in Regina going to a Rough Riders game is completely different than a fan in Ottawa going to a Red Blacks game. It's that simple. People can say it. Operators can say it. But how many other operators have lived it, right? Very few. I have. I've worked with the XFL before. I've worked with the CFL before. I've driven every inch of the Trans-Canada Highway. I've been to CFL games uh Almost every, almost for every team, I've been to a great cup. My daughter played, my daughter played in the, in the, in the, <laughs> the CFL flag football championship in Edmonton right before the, that great cup representing, representing Toronto. Like there's something so uniquely ex all experience that I believe very few, if no operators truly appreciate. And my hope is that, Hey, there's going to be other operators that the CFL and the teams are going to work with. I hope that those operators take the time to actually understand what it's like to be a Canadian football fan. Maybe they can learn quickly. I don't know. 
Mike, we'll see. I, I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, that, that is, that's one thing, you know, I, I was just had feedback from some of our listeners today. Uh, you know, some of the time that we put into learning the CFL game, you know, as we've expanded our coverage versus some of the others and, and, you know, they, they can sniff through that, right. The Canadians can kind of sniff through that authenticity, uh, talking about the XFL, I would be remiss, you know, um, when all this came out and, you know, we had Naylor and we had the, you know, the three down guys and all that. And they're saying like, well, um, you know, 20 million a year, whatever, right off the bat, all this money's coming in, you know? And I think Naylor was like, well, yeah, but think about, you know, adding, you know, if you doubled the number of teams, you know, added the number of people involved, you know, with obviously with the U S fans watching that stuff, is this, does the passing of this, does this fuel the XFL CFL partnership talks? What, what are your thoughts on all that stuff as it relates to to what you do? You know, I honestly don't think the passing of C218 fuels the, the conversation. Um, I think that, you know, as, as said, you know, I've worked, I worked with the XFL when I was running monkey knife fight. We were the second company. We actually put our logo on the back of the LA wildcats helmet. The XFL folks are great. And I'm, I'm actually, you know, quite friendly with, with some of the folks at Redbird that own the XFL. Um, I have a lot of, respect for them. I have a lot of respect for the folks at the CFL. I think that these conversations are still ongoing. I think that there is a potential exciting opportunity as a merger. I also think there's an exciting opportunity for each league to exist independently of one another. I think C218, what that does from a CFL perspective is I think it gives them um, in the short term, a bit of a, a you know, a bit of a, a boost, right? It's kind of like if you watch Fast and Furious movies, it's like the, you know, hitting that NAS button. You know what I mean? I think it's going to spark up. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be great for them coming back this year. Um, the reality is the real, I think the real opportunities around C218 and single event sports betting will come to the CFL next year. Um, but I, I honestly, I, I think that the idea of a merger, it's such a big idea. And it's such a complicated idea that I don't think, I think it was a, you know, the reality is there's sports betting in the States, right? Or sorry, it's rolling out across the States. Um, And by the time a merger would happen, the assumption is it would have rolled out across, it's going to roll out across more U.S. states. And I think even while the conversations with the XFL and the CFL uh, were, were beginning, the idea of sports betting in Canada was something that was a matter of when, not if. So I don't think the passing yesterday actually has any real impact on the merger because I think it was kind of a a perceived reality that at some point, uh, Canadians and Americans uh, in certain provinces and states would have sports betting or single event sports betting and a, a merged league uh, would have an opportunity to take advantage of that reality. At the same time, like I said, I mean, I'm a huge believer in what the XFL tried to do. I think uh, I had a lot of respect. I got to know a lot of the the folks at the league. It's great people. I think the games, as you watch during the season, the games got better, right? I mean, and even you see a guy like PJ Walker who goes in and plays for the Panthers and, and plays, play pretty well. Like, you're starting to see the opportunity there. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, at the same time, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the CFL. I'm not a diehard CFL fan, like, but I'm a fan, right? I grew up in, I'm a, I'm a Montrealer. So when the Owls came back and started playing at, at Molson stadium, like that was such an incredible experience. And, and I went to university in Atlantic Canada and and I went to school with a couple and a couple of guys that I went to school with played in the CFL, like Eric LaPointe, who you'll probably remember. Like Eric was is one of the, the greatest. I think Eric is the greatest can, Canadian university football player of all time. Eric played in the league for the Ticats for um, for for the Owls. And I, I can't remember if he played for anybody else. And another one of our friends, you know, Philip Girard played played for the, the Eskimos, now the Elks. You know, and so I've been a big fan of the CFL for many years, and it's just a unique, identifiably Canadian experience. And as you can probably guess, like 
I'm as patriotic as they come, man. Like I love this country and whether I like the NFL or I like the CFL, I like football and I love Canada. So guess what I'm watching, you know, (laughs) when the CFL is on, I'm watching the games, you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, I just, I'm excited about what this is going to mean to add additional revenues for the league to provide a better foundation to grow the sport. Cause ultimately that's what it's going to do merger or not. Uh, I don't want to hold you too long today. You've been, you know, so gracious with your time, I, kind of the last uh, big question I had, and it was all the way back. I think when I originally reached out to you, I saw your interview talking about, you know, guaranteed life for the CFL, all these things. And, and fundamentally it was, uh, something along the lines of like, this is going to, this is the quickest, easiest way to kind of like fix uh, the CFL business model, right? And, and I thought, you know, because again, it, I hear these you know, every day, you know, the CFL, the business model is broken, all these things, they need to work on this. And I thought, well, it is, it's like a NOS, like you were saying, or it's like a band aid, but it's not. I feel like this is another way for them not to ultimately self-reflect, right? And figure out how to get away from gates and stuff. I mean, obviously this is huge, but do you see how we, I kind of, we're grappling with that where like, this is great and this is going to shoot them to the moon, but, but maybe that foundation still is a little shaky that we're kind of building this off of now, the skyscraper. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me throw this back to you. Let me ask you a question. What's the biggest challenge that's been facing the CFL over the last number of years? Fans in the seats. No, but more more specifically, what do fans in the seats mean? Well, gate revenue. Money. Yeah. Money. It's money. This is money. And this is a lot of money. I mean, it, it's kind yeah. of that simple. There's no other seven-figure-plus truck yeah. you know, or, or a truck with seven figures-plus rolling up to the stadium of the teams, let alone the leagues, right? This is the ability to basically say, give me money now. And people like me saying, here's some money now. There's, this is it, right? You're not going to see, you know, a big Canadian brand all of a sudden say, okay, CFL, we're going to give you, you know, eight figures, or we're going to give teams seven figures to be, you know, the, the, you know, yes, maybe the CFL, if they want to put you know names on their jerseys of prominent Canadian brands and take away the the you know the take away a lot of the the football identity of what it's like to look at the the uniforms, but even that's not gonna add the types of revenues that I think well, that I know sports gaming is. So I mean it's just that simple read, like it's, it's money. It's money. Yeah, I and I, I I certainly and I get that as someone though that has um you know watched and uh, not professionally covered but watched and covered like the WWE and wrestling for years right uh, WWE right now is on the highest revenue they've ever had right in terms of like money coming in and global expansion all these things but you know uh, like the product is stale you know fan attendance obviously so that's just my fear it's like we're gonna get all this money but the CFL still won't be able to fill you know the Argo Stadium or they still won't be able to fill you know that well, that's my concern this is where this is where we this is where we also come into play the other the other piece to this puzzle is the revenue that's going to come into the space. What it's also going to do is it's going to drive innovation, which is really exciting. Part of that innovation is going to be the in-stadium experience. It will not be far in the future when you can be sitting in a stadium and you're making bets on your phone while you're watching the game. And, And there will be exclusive prizing, exclusive opportunities to drive a consumer to a game that they necessarily wouldn't be able to participate in if they're sitting on their couch, right? So these are some of the, I mean, the, 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 that, that's kind of the thing that I, that I didn't talk about before is this money is going into the sports ecosystem. Part of that ecosystem is also going to be driving innovation, right? And, and the multiplayer market that's coming into most of these provinces, hopefully, is also going to drive innovation. People are going to want to make better products. Teams and the league are going to want to figure out better experiences to deliver to their fans. So I think that that is a big issue that I think this is going to help solve. I think you bring up the WWE and it's a really interesting uh, comparison. 
I think part of the part of the challenge the CFL has always had is that there's a lack of major star system attached to CFL players, right? I think that what sports gambling is going to do, I hope, is it's going to shine another light on specific Canadian or CFL players, right? Because when you think about sports betting, it's not just I'm going to take the Alouettes minus four and a half against the Red Blacks. Um, It's player props as well, right? So now I'm going to be able to place bets on specific players about whether they're going to throw over under a certain amount of yards, catch over unders, you know, you know what I mean? So this, the Canadian football fan is going to be engaged and is going to become a lot more familiar with a lot of the Canadian football athletes. And now the trick is going to be how the CFL is going to take this additional money and how the teams are hopefully going to take this additional in-venue experience opportunity and figure out a way to integrate players into that. Not necessarily saying the players need to be involved in the promotion of betting because that's not (laughs) something that I think is, is, is necessarily a good idea. But it's you have additional revenues now. You have additional eyeballs now. Okay. How are we going to use that to start shining a light on some of our players that are now going to be more recognizable because of betting, right? So I think that that's going to be a big challenge for the league. The WWE generates so much revenue because they're able to create a real authentic bridge to the WWE fan through them following these stars, right? I mean, geez, I haven't watched WWE in a long time probably since it was called WWE, (laughs) WWF back in the day, right? So, you know, ultimately, you know, I was a big WWE fan um, and it was because of the personalities, right? Um, You know, I I remember being, I remember in the heyday of when I was a kid, you know, or when I was really into it, when it was like, you know, The Rock, Stone Cold, Triple H, during that whole dynamic, it was just so much fun. Um, you know, and I've, I've disengaged, but ultimately the next generation of WWE fans, they're attached to the stars, right? They like the Roman Reigns of the world and the Luke Bryans. And I apologize if I'm missing these names, but, <laughs> okay. but whatever, I, I know that they've yeah. been around at some point recently. Um, and so I do think that that's where if I were the CFL, if I were the teams, I'd try and figure out a way to get my players into the limelight a little bit more because to me that's also let's face it that's also how you um produce some extra revenue streams that's how you know you get young fans even more engaged when they have folks when they have players to look up to so that would be my you know if i if i if i was you know um if i was tasked with Uh, how to utilize C218. It's not just money. It's, we have additional money now. Okay, how are we going to use it? Oh, I think we should figure out unique ways to harness the extra engagement that sports betting is going to provide the CFL, both in venue and at home and through broadcast. Um, Harness that new engagement, take the additional money, and then figure out what that means and how to shine a light on the players to help bring them into the limelight a little bit more. Does that make sense? It is. And I hope that uh, someone is listening and I hope that someone, yes, because that's the thing is, uh, and, and I'll let you go here. You've been so gracious with your time is, you know, you all, we can have all the money, all the smart, everyone else in the world, right? All you, everyone else surrounding the CFL, all this different stuff. But if, if they're still, just kind of stuck, that's just, you know, that's my concern. But um, no, I think I, uh, Again, utilizing that building stars, you know, just today, you know, we have these retire, uh, you know, players retiring and, you know, uh, sending shockwaves. And, and it's like there should be uh, we need to have more of a focus on that than the players. And, and I certainly agree. But, uh, Nick, thank you so much for your time. You're a busy man. I'm sure this week is just, this has been crazy, but I'm glad that we got this scheduled ahead of time. And uh, every once in a while, my luck works out and it did work out this week in terms of uh, timing. So thank you. Reed, my absolute pleasure. You 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 know how to find me. You're a great follow on 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 Twitter. So uh, and and thank you for for doing the same with me. But uh, yeah, no, I, I'm a fan of of what you're doing. So keep up the great work, brother. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. 
Support for the Marquez brought to you by Manscaped. They're the best in below the waist grooming for men and women. You know, the, the razor's nice and soft. You can you can use it too, ladies. Uh, they offer precision, 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 if I could get that out, precision, I, I'm going to stop trying to say that word, uh, engineered tools for your family jewels, Manscaped. They just launched, launched their uh, lawnmower 4.0. It's the fourth generation trimmer. Uh, two million men, over two million men worldwide. Trust Manscaped. And with this exclusive offer for you, you get 20% off free shipping with the code MarkCast at manscaped.com. There it is. Look at that. MarkCast. On the jersey, easy to remember. Read. I like. Uh, I, I do like listening to other podcasts now, uh, as they also, you know, Man, Manscaped is is you know spreading the globe, and it is interesting to see how other people choose to to sell this. But uh, it's it, it's good. You know, I, like I said, I've used it. The light's good. Water. I don't know. Again, you got the quick charge. I'm not doing an everyday tune up kind of thing. I'm like kind of like a once a season kind of guy. But uh, it's it's great to have. Like once in fall, once in spring, once in summer, once a season? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, yeah, it's fine. Uh, I will say, uh, I posted on Twitter this week, uh, Chad Ochocinco, I think Manscaped is on the I Am Athlete podcast now. And, and Chad had some very vulgar words that he was using about the Manscaped. So don't, but yeah, use the code MarkCast, get 20% off free shipping. It's a great deal. They're not that, I don't think they're that, I didn't pay for it, but I don't think they're that expensive anyway, but you get your 20% off. But they work great. The light's great. Very happy with our, our partnership with Manscaped. Definitely. And I mean, you know, I use it like I, I apparently grow hair faster in certain areas than Reed does. So I use it once every maybe two weeks wow. instead of once every summer. Whoa, just, Whoa. wow, bro. Wow. Gonna throw that out there. And uh, you're just going to throw that out there uh, for, for everybody that, uh, you know, like I, I need to use it regularly and I, I like to keep it, keep it completely trimmed. So again, if you like it completely trimmed, it's a great razor. It's very soft that, that, that technology that doesn't nick your, your, your area is is great for men and women. I can't say that enough. Men women, women, use this use this trimmer too. Why not? But your own. Buy your own. You know, don't use your man's. Just buy your own. Easy to do. Twenty percent off free shipping right now with the code Marcast at Manscaped.com. That's twenty percent off with free shipping at Manscaped.com. Use our code Marcast. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Steve Simmons from the Toronto Sun, also a CFL Hall of Fame press member back in 2009. Congrats on that. Welcome to the show, Steve. Nice to be here, guys. Good to have you. We love having our Canadian, uh, you know, press members on, you know, people that are really tuned in to the CFL uh, to kind of educate us along the way. So we're glad to have you. Um, let's start with the first things first, the big news that came out this week, uh, C218. How does that help? <laughs> Well, I think it will help in terms of advertising revenue for the teams involved. Um, I think what you're going to see is there's going to be competition to we want to get in the stadiums. We want to be the person who's you know, the company that you're going to um, do business with, you know, whether it be DraftKings or whomever that, that company happens to be, whether it's the score, uh, they're going to have to pay for um, you know, signage in stadiums and they're going to have to pay for advertising in stadiums and possibly for having, you know, places where you can wager in stadiums, which you're already seeing now in the United States. Uh, so that's where I think teams can benefit from, you know, who's going to do business with whom, who's going to be the most aggressive in terms of how they're going to go about it. Is this going to be done from a league point of view, from an individual team point of view? Uh, and, and how is that going to work for everybody? I think this is a great unknown. And no one knows exactly what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. But it's pretty easy to see that if they had no gambling revenue yesterday, they're going to have some tomorrow. It just uh, and I we talked with Nick Solsky yesterday. He's kind of the points bet Canada guy that's you know spearheading some of this stuff up there. Uh, it just to me it seems like we're putting a lot of heavy lifting on the CFL. I've always said before on here we've been told for months you know CFL doesn't know how to market. They're struggling to market. They're lacking in these things. But yet the same people now you know I'm like we talk like uh, I listen to the three down guys. They complain all the time about marketing. But now they go. But now with C two one A. CFL is really going to have a chance to market. And I'm saying, but why, why are we feeling that now? Do you get what I'm saying? Well, I think people are excited that they can bet on individual games, which we haven't been able to do unless every other person who bets online and wants to make a bet anyhow 
can can make that bet any time. So that's part of what I really don't understand about some of the new excitement. If you're a guy who wants to gamble, guess what? You've been gambling. And you've been gambling for years. And if you haven't been gambling on the CFL, it's probably because the CFL doesn't interest you. Uh, and, and so I think what they're trying to see or determine here is the, the audience that isn't doing the bodogging and any of those other companies now and doesn't have an online account and isn't doing that. Maybe they're the guys that go to the um, convenience store now to do ProLine in Ontario, which you have to pick three games not one. Now you can go back to one and anybody that yeah, has gambled at all. And I, you know, one time I was someone who enjoyed a wager or two, um, <laughs> you know, a parlay bet to pick three games is next to impossible to pick one. Correct. You know, you got a pretty good chance or at least a 50, 50 chance. Uh, and so, you know, I think people who like that kind of gambling are going to do that kind of gambling. Why that appeals or applies to the CFL is a whole other issue. And one thing I wonder about is, what is the age of the people who want to, want to gamble? And, and are they online gamblers? Are they guys your ages? Uh, because if they are, that's not the CFL's audience. And this is one of the problems the CFL has in, in marketing itself. Its market is, is quite old. It's, it's a 40 plus market in a below 40 world. And, and so that's always a, a question of how are you going to do it? Who is it going to affect? And is the guy who would never make a bet, the 30-year-old who would never make a bet on a CFL game, suddenly going to bet the Edmonton-Calgary game this weekend? I'm not so sure that's true. You're taking the words right out of my mouth. You really are taking the words right out of my mouth. It seems like single game, game betting is a young man's sport. And right now we've all voiced our concerns. And that, by we, I mean, people that have come on the show and have voiced their concerns that people 35 and under don't really pay attention to the CFL and those that do very few and far between. So what is, what is the potential of, I guess the, the exposure that what is, what is the, what is the sales pitch to a company to to put signage in a stadium where they're advertising to a demo that doesn't necessarily, you know, do the same. So is your, is your advertising in the stadium for the people in the stadium or is your advertising in the stadium for the people on television to watch? And that's where the CFL gets interesting because I'll use Toronto as an example, because it's probably the worst example of, of the worst run franchise in the league. Um, you know, they'll have 11 or 12,000 people in the stands and they'll have 300,000 watching on television. Uh, and, and so they're a decent TV draw and they're a terrible stadium draw. So when Bodog is putting an ad or whoever it is that's putting the ad in, in, in the stadium, you know, in the end zone, are they putting that ad there for exposure to the guy in the stadium who needs a cane to go up and down and sit in his seats or are they putting it for the guy who's at home watching on TV who's considerably younger but still not the audience that you want to attract and and that's why some of this talk of possible expansion and or you know inclusion of the XFL and the CFL is you know if you have a league 2 years down the road that's 18 teams instead of nine, then gambling becomes somewhat more attractive than it is right now. Um, I mean, and so do things like fantasy football, where you can't really play fantasy football in, in a, in a nine-team nine league. It, it just doesn't work. You know, but by the time you, you, you've had, how many teams are you going to have in your league? You know, four, so there, there, goes, your, there goes your starting quarterbacks. Uh, and, and so it, it can't work the way the way fantasy has taken over in the NFL. I mean, it's just enormous how big it has become in the NFL where you can walk into an NFL locker room and players will will know what round they've gone in in their in the in the beat writers local draft kind of thing. And, and everyone gets mad. How come I did? How come I went so low or how come I wasn't drafted? You know, we've never had that in the CFL because the CFL's never had enough teams to be able to accommodate that kind of thing. So. 
I always think uh, fantasy and and gambling kind of go hand in hand, and prop bets um, play into that as well. And I just wonder how all that's going to work with an older CFL audience, and and who knows who's watching on TV. Yeah, it's just hard because um, even uh, Nick, like I said, Nick was uh, points bet. You know, you are able to bet on these games right now in these gray markets, right? Or and it's not you know the legit team sponsored league sponsored things but you know like we go back to fantasy you know if you go to TSN or whatever to do fantasy right it redirects you to ESPN right i mean they don't even do that right and and nick had said that um since you know the C218 passed that i think three of the teams so far had reached out to him right to try to figure out stuff to do and so you know when when the CFL the way it's run with these nine independent whatever's you're you're really placing a lot on each of these teams to be like, okay, are the Rough Riders really going to get involved in this? Right? It's and and, and where it's, I think it's going to be separate all in the provinces too, right? Where everyone there's just a lot of like everyone's going to all have to do their thing. Well, here's the thing: this is a great point of confusion now in professional sport. It's not just the CFL. Oh, the CFL is kind of late to this because the bill was just passed, but. All of pro sport over the last few years has tried to figure out how can we make money on gambling and how can we cut ourselves in if there's so much of it going on, how do we get a piece of the action? And now you're seeing in the U.S. where I'll use the Washington Capitals and the Washington Wizards as an example, in their arena for next season, you'll be able to go and, and, and place bets. And it's almost like they're going to have a sports book right in the arena. So instead of being in Vegas where you sit and watch 12 television sets, you'll probably be able to sit down in Washington and have a drink and watch the game you're at and probably four or five other games all at the same time, you know, like you're in a casino or a sports book in, in Vegas. And I think what's happening in not just the NHL and the NBA, but, you know, the CFL obviously needs external sources of revenue, much more so than the other leagues because it doesn't have the television contracts and the, and the, you know, the paid for sponsorships that the other professional leagues have. And so it needs, you know, historically it's gate driven and, you know, they make their money or lose their money selling tickets. Now this is a possibility. And I, I, I emphasize the word possibility. So yeah, everyone's reaching out to the Nick Solskis of the world and everyone's reaching out to anyone that knows anything about this because guess what? They don't know anything about it. And they're just trying to figure out how do I make a buck and how do I make a buck on this and what's the buck going to be and who's going to pay for it. What's like, if I, if I'm, uh, maybe I'm the Hamilton Tiger Cats and I sell the rights in my stadium to the Ontario Lottery Corporation, like, is that a better deal for me than an individual, you know, offshore guy, or is that a better deal than whatever other possibilities are going to be? Or is, are Tiger Cats going to create their own gambling entity. Uh, And I'm just using that as an example. I think everyone is right now in the, what is this? How do we make money? How much money can we make? And and how is it all going to work out? And everybody from the guys selling it at the one end to the guys trying to, you know, you know, get rich or rich isn't the right word to bring in some revenue from the other end uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great unknown. I mean, the newspapers are doing it right now. I know for a fact that the Toronto star, which is a, basically the largest paper in the country has hired like a gambling editor and they're now going to be doing much. And, and they're going into the online betting business themselves, the newspapers as a side thing to their paper. They're going to have a website where you can go and, and basically gamble and, and, and do casino things. Uh, I know we're the, tr- the sun chain is looking at, you know, what's next and how is it going to work? You know, everybody's trying to figure out what the answer is. And at this point, no one really knows. Is there any concern or any um, support systems put in place? And I hate to be kind of the Debbie Downer here, but gambling can be a, a very addictive thing to do. Are there any support systems being put in place or considered to be put in place to kind of help people if they're having a problem? Well, here's the problem with what you're asking for of whoever the, you know, whether it's the CFL or the NFL or the, 
NBA or, or whatever. The people who are going to gamble and need to gamble are going to gamble, whether it's legal, whether it's illegal. Um, they're going to ha- you're going to have your problems just as you have your problems in society with other addictions and, uh, and other problems. And I'm not sure it's the responsibility of the CFLs of the world and of any league, really, to be policing you know, possible addiction issues under those circumstances. Because I, I'm a, I mean, I grew up in a house with addiction. So I'm pretty well versed on how powerful it is and how terrible it can be. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, I'm not so sure that any external force of any kind could have helped my brother. And, and so maybe my view of things is skewed somewhat through my own personal experiences, but I'm not sure it's, it's their responsibility. And as he told me once, the only way I can get better is if I want to get better. And he never wanted to get better, and he never did. I'm, I'm terribly sorry to hear that. Um, I didn't mean to. I didn't bring the, mean to be. The no, I mean, I, I, this is a long time now, so I'm not talking about anything that's new. Um, no, I guess he, I'm just like saying, like when when you go to Vegas, you see these uh, these ads, and they're like, if you have a gambling problem, call these help numbers. I'm asking, I'm asking more or less: is is the government implementing any of these things? Do you think well, that, that would not knowing the go- knowing the government and how it operates in this country? We'll come up with some phony, half-witted um, thing that says, look, if you have a problem, call this number and, you know, you'll call there and it'll ring 92 times and you won't be able to get anyone to talk on the other end. Uh, you know, I, I just I think they do that for lip service and for so so that the critics of like when the, a bill like this passes, there's going to be the first thing the critics are going to say is, oh, you're you're now contributing to, you know, problems in society, you know. There's a government that makes enormous amounts of money and taxation on from liquor and, and cigarettes, um, you know. But n- nonetheless, we'll we'll, tr- we'll turn our back on that for a minute and and make sure that people don't have problems betting on sports. Um, I I just think that it, it's a great topic, it's a great suggestion, it's a wondrous thing, and you know even if they say they're doing it and if they you know pretend they're doing it, it it won't be done the the right way or it won't be done really at all i guess my biggest question and and what uh, spurred me one of the reasons to have you on among many is if i'm someone that lives in canada and i don't watch the cfl you know yesterday am i going to watch it today now because i can bet on it well i can tell you as a as a guy who likes to gamble once in a while if it's the middle of summer and you don't love baseball, and there's nothing on, and you want to put five bucks on a game. I mean, sometimes I'll, like, I find a $1 bet and a $1,000 bet feel the same. You lose as badly of the $1 as you lose the other. Like, that, that's the, the beauty and the, and, and the pain of gambling is that no matter – you can have – like, you ever played a fantasy football game and you lose on the last moment on some weird – you know, play that costs you 10 yards and then suddenly you've lost it on a penalty and now you've lost the game. Like you're dying inside, even though the game caught it, it's of no value. So I think what might happen is that the guy who doesn't care in the middle of summer, maybe even in the U S might put on a football game and say, you know what? I, if I'm going to watch this, I need 10 bucks on, uh, on the, on the blue bombers. Or whatever. I think you're going to get some of that. But, um, how much of it? I don't know. And I think that's where, again, where the XFL thing comes in. If it's suddenly your town playing against Hamilton or Ottawa or whomever, then maybe, yeah, maybe you are. Uh, I think that's where the expansion of the league or the expansion of how they do business could work in down the road. Uh, but again, to me, this is still assuming that someone is predisposed to want to gamble, right? They just the the casual football fan, who I think that the CFL needs to attract more of, 
you know, cause this is like a subsection of a subsection, right? So if I'm someone, you know, I cover, like I've never, Paul and I, we famously bet one time in Vegas on the, and I don't know. I don't, I never bet on anything, right. In terms of uh, sports. So that's my question is, yeah, if you're, if you want to gamble, okay, I'll gamble on the CFL, but I'm just someone that, you know, I just don't think that you're opening the door to these, you know, 20 million more people that it wasn't open to yesterday because you can gamble now. Well, again, that comes down to like, I'm a season ticket holder for the Argos and I'm 64 years old and I'm about the youngest person in my section. Um, like, when I say they're going up and down the aisles in Canes, I'm not kidding. They are going up and down the aisles in Canes. And um, that's, a, you go to a Grey Cup, and what do you see? You don't see very many people under 50. Like most of the people wandering the streets and going to the bars and taking in the parties and all that stuff, it's an older, wider crowd. What the CFL has long to figure out or long to do is how do we get people your age watching? How do we get them interested? How do we get their friends interested? How do we get minor minorities interested? Which is, I mean, if you walk around Toronto today, you know, you can't take three steps without seeing a minority. Like it's, you know, but you don't see them at sporting events other than Raptor games, maybe soccer games. You won't see them at very many Toronto Maple Leafs games, and you certainly don't see any at, or very many at Argo games. And you know, this, the, the the league itself, across the board and across the country, uh, has not really found a way to get new Canadians involved in the Canadian Football League. And it's been a challenge for Randy Ambrosi as commissioner, and it's been a challenge for virtually every commissioner who came before him. And one of the things, and I, I'm going to make a terrible analogy of sorts here that probably will get me in trouble somewhere in the world. But if I walk into Casino Niagara, which is about an hour and a half from where I live, or Casino Rama, which is about an hour, hour and a half from where I live in the other direction, then I will be a minority as a white person in that casino. And often uh, the majority will be some kind of Asians. They're gambling. They're gambling a lot. Um, are they watching football? Are they betting on football? Are they watching CFL? Um, how do you get them into CFL? How do you get their dollars to it? come out of those casinos and into CFL stadiums and even CFL betting. And that's challenges for the people involved to, you know, to get to groups that clearly have shown an interest in gambling and not necessarily in football. And at the same time, just to go flip it for one second, I have friends who who don't believe anyone would ever watch. I mean, I love football, so I love the sport. And my kids played and I played. And uh, I just really, really enjoy the game. But I know people that don't think people, anyone would watch the NFL if they couldn't bet or didn't have props on Sundays or didn't have a pool to go in or something. Um, I don't necessarily take that approach because I think the game is so great that I'm happy just to watch. And I can, I can watch a high school game or a college game or a CFL game or an NFL. I don't care. I just like the game. Um, but lots of people believe that gambling is, you know, has kept the NFL as the number one sport in America. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I think the NFL is more like a family thing where, you know, you have parties, you bring people over. And I think that's what kind of dri drives it here, at least for us, is that, you know, the Super Bowl specifically is a, is a family event. So, I guess uh, I guess I don't necessarily agree with that, but hmm, that's well. That's I, I, I you have to understand. I live in a city that doesn't have an NFL team. Right, I get that. And and so uh, I remember years ago, my newspaper did a poll: which team should we cover? Um, because we do a lot of NFL, we do a lot of NFL coverage in our paper, and and what what amazed us was 
how vast the interest was. Not It wasn't Buffalo Bills based, even though they're an hour and a half away. Like I live in a house, for example, where my kids are now no longer at home. But when they were at home, where I had a, a Seahawks fan and a Raiders fan. Um, I sent the Raiders fan for treatment a few times. That was a whole different issue. But, you know, and, and, they, and when they get together with their buddies, they're in their 30s now. When they get together with their buddies, you know, there's a Tampa fan and a Colts fan. and everybody's got, Everybody has a different team. And so that's what you get in a city like this one. So maybe it's not the same as a family getting together for, for a football game because in this case, the family's getting together or the kids are getting together and they're all of different, you know, they all have diff- their own different favorite teams. Rarely did, do any of them have the same one. Uh, question for you, since we, you know, I, I feel like we've beaten this, uh, although the sports betting is fascinating to me, uh, you had mentioned the XFL before, uh, as obviously someone that, uh, you know, lifelong CFL fan, you know, in, in the Canadian, you know, football hall of fame, uh, but also someone that loves football yourself. Uh, what, what struck you with, with all that, when you heard all the talks come out about the merger and partnerships or whatever the heck's going to end up happening? Uh, my first thought, having lived through both the, the expansion to the United States and other attempts of other leagues to to make it, is this is a lot of hogwash. Um, you know, we lived through the XFL once before. We lived through the World Football League. You know, there was supposed to be a Toronto team in in the original World Football League where they signed Larry Zonka and Jim Kick and, and Paul Warfield from the Miami Dolphins wound up playing in Memphis the government at the time wouldn't allow them into Canada, um, probably well before your days. Um, but we've seen all, how many startup leagues have there been over the years? Any of them finished yet? Like suddenly they don't even finish their seasons. So here's the CFL a hundred plus years old where I've been covering it now for in the 40 year range. I'm going to go through this. I covered the bankruptcy of the Calgary Stampeders, the bankruptcy of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the bankruptcy of the Argos, the bankruptcy of the Ticats, the bankruptcy of various teams in Ottawa. So that's five of, think, of nine teams that went bankrupt. Uh, and the league, the league still exists. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like the, you know, it's like bugs around your, outside your house. You know, you, you, you think you've killed them and the, the next day they're back again. And that's the CFL. You know, it can't go away. But I'm not so sure why you're going to want to do business with, for lack of a better word, a fly-by-nighter, um, unless there's something extremely attractive financially for you. Because otherwise, you know, you've got a league. You've been in business. You know, the other guys have been in business four and a half weeks or whatever it's been. I mean, the, the current owners with The Rock and everybody else, well, they haven't played anything yet. They haven't, they haven't had a season yet. They don't even have franchises. They have coaches. I don't think they have anything. So what do they have? They have The Rock and some other, you know, some other rich people that, you know, want to do something with, with, with their money. But, you know, I understand Randy Ambrosi listening. I just don't believe necessarily. And, and I'm, I'm more in the minority when it comes to guys who've been around the league I just don't believe anything of, of, sub, of substance will happen here. Okay. So let me point out some, some I think, some, some discrepancies here. The, the first thing first, I want to get this out here because I didn't have a chance to do it with uh, our friend Arash that came on and, and kind of said what you said, but very, in a very like condescending tone. So I, you know, we kind of appreciate the soft way you've delivered <laughs> your message here. Um, the arena football, first and foremost, that, that had a good 20-year run. Uh, second of all, I think the difference between the two leagues is that the Canadian Football League has owners of indiv- individual franchises where one franchise can declare bankruptcy and it doesn't sink the entire league where the XFL hasn't had that where different owners own different teams. So I think that's the that's the difference here between these two leagues that we're 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 kind of neglecting here. Well, I just uh, here's what I don't understand. If you speak one language and I speak another language, we're going to have trouble communicating. If I play three-down football and you play four-down football, I've got a problem. If you play 100-yard football and I play 110-yard football with a 25-yard end zone or a 20-yard end zone, we have things to talk about. There, There are so many 
little things. You know, one of the, um, what do they call it, intricacies historically of the Canadian Football League, even though almost every star I can name of the last 30 years is an American, is that there are 14 or 16 Canadians starting on every roster or how many, whatever the number is, it changes, you know, as, yeah. as the, you know, as the ratio goes, but you can't now tell an American team you have to have, as they did when they expanded uh, to Baltimore and other places that you can't, that you need to have Canadians. Uh, first of all, it's against the law, I think in the United States, um, that you have to have this many Canadians on your roster. So, so you're looking at changing the premise or everything that's been the Canadian Football League, uh, and there's lots to like about it. And frankly, there's lots not to like. Um, you know, like with any league, the the difference being is you know all the rest of pro sports as we know it is ostensibly succeeding, even with pen, even in the pandemic. You know. You know, the NHL is a go and the NBA is a go and Major League Soccer is a go. And all these leagues are the CFL is now walking on eggshell. I mean, it always does walk on eggshells, but it's a different kind of eggshells now because so many things are happening, including in the last couple of days, the retirement of some pretty prominent Canadian players um, who obviously I think what happened is, is they found jobs or discovered their professions in the pandemic and realize that, you know, it's probably beneficial to them. Not like, uh, it's not like you play in the NFL, you're last guy in the roster, you're making 500 grand. You know, if you're the last guy in the roster, you're making, you know, 62 grand or whatever the number happens to be. Uh, it's not life sustaining money. Uh, and, and so guys, I think you're going to see more and more Canadians saying, you know what, I got a job. It's a pretty good one. I think rather than bash my head in for that extra kind of money, I'm going to stay here. So, you know, there are so many issues the CFL has to fix on its own that I'm not sure bringing in partners, unless there's a big number to be made money wise, bringing in partners makes a whole lot of sense. And I've never had anybody explain it to me, not the commissioner not any of his underlings, not the advocates who believe in it. I've never heard anybody explain to me how exactly this is going to work. Uh, my question for you would be, and you said that um, you may be in the minority, right, in terms of not being excited about it, because, you know, we've heard reports and talked to people where it seems like a lot of higher ups, a lot of the team owners, a lot of the, you know, whatever, are excited about that. So is that... Um, is that correct, right? Do a lot of the people that you work with and talk with and know, are, are they more bullish on it than you? I don't know if bullish should be the right term. I think intrigued by how much money can be made, where can it be made, you know, where can they save, what can they save from? And I think it's, it's I hate to say it, because I think they might be getting sold a bill of goods by, by a commissioner who, frankly, has been in that sort of sales pitch before he started that whole CFL 2.0 thing with Europe. I never understood, you know, where that went or how it went. And I don't think they spent a whole lot of money on it. I'm not sure they've gained a whole lot of anything other than, I know they were looking to try and get a TV contract of some kind in Europe. Uh, I don't think that's worked out. Uh, and this, when I say people are bullish, I'm talking about, uh, I'll use some of my friends like Dave Naylor, who's one of the CFL reporters at TSN or, Rat, or uh, Farhan Lalji, also with TSN. You know, it's, you know, they're more believing that there's something to be had here, that there's business to be made. Like they, I think they're more optimistic than I happen to be. And, and I'm, and I'm, as I'm optimistic, I'm also concerned that you can't sell out your principles. You can't sell off three downs. You can't sell off, you know, the ratio on the rosters. You may be able to trim it slightly. Um, there are things in my mind you can't do and, and still be who you are and still look yourself in the mirror. Um, but having said that, this is the only league 
that I can think of that did a play last year. Like every other league, they came back under bubbles or circumstances without fans. CFL couldn't afford to do that. They couldn't afford to pay for all that testing and pay for all the travel and pay for all the thing without getting anybody in the stands. And so now this upcoming year, so much is going to be focused on where they're at right now and where they're going. And, you know, and go, to go back to where we began the conversation, um, you know, you know, if there's money to be made from gambling, whether it's by selling advertising or putting, you know, things in your own, own stadiums, then they're going to explore that, you know. But again, like anything else, everything to me, including what's coming up for this season, including the XFL talk, including everything is a great unknown. All right. Steve Simmons, we want to thank you for your time from the Toronto Sun, of course, CFL Hall of Fame press member in 2019. Want to thank you for your time joining us here on the Markcast. Thank you. Appreciate it. By the way, that's the only time anyone's ever introduced me as a CFL Hall of Famer. So I'm I'm pumped well, by that. We like to give you your we like to give you your props here on the Markcast. We like to we like to do that a lot. With Terrific. anybody that comes on that has the credentials you have, we definitely like to give you your props. So we thank you for your time. Okay. Welcome back. I want to thank Nick and Steve for their time. Uh, of course, great talk with them. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how this, uh, this, this pans out. Yeah. I uh, really appreciate that. You know, I, I don't know the single game sports betting. We'll see. I, I feel like I, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe I don't, I don't think <laughs> I, again, I, I think don't it's think a coin toss. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a literal coin flip if it's going to work out and, and bring those, bring those dollars in. Yeah. So bear with me here that we got, this is a big XFL. We still got some more CFL stuff coming up. This big article came out this week, Dan Kaplan, uh, Daniel Kaplan, whatever, talking from the, uh, the athletic, um, they're, they're finalizing all the XFL bankruptcy stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're going to hear a lot. And I've already had people messaging me. You're going to hear a lot about like XFL players, not getting paid, getting paid pennies on the dollar, getting paid, you know, 8% of what they were supposed to get. This is what's happening. And again, uh, I, I've already said on online and Twitter and stuff, um, you know, current XFL management should not be held responsible for past decisions, right? So any decisions that were made, this was Vince, you know, previous company. Obviously, I understand that, you know, they brought in the XFL. There's the history there. But all the players got paid up through the end of when they played. Right. Okay. So uh, then when the when the league shuttered, then there was like that another week or two before they declare bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. The players were also paid for that time. And at the time, a lot of people thought, wow, well, that's, that's cool. Like, cause there was always the rumors, like they were going to come back and do the, the playoffs and the championship game and not like, you know, skip the rest of the season when we all thought COVID was only going to be like a four week thing or whatever. Right. So the, the players got paid for that. Mm -hmm. So then when the bankruptcy stuff came out, Kenneth Farrow, friend, you know, we know Kenneth Farrow, he's doing the players union stuff. And so he's going, all right, guys, we are going to submit claims for all the players and we're going to get paid for that remaining seven weeks. Already, there's a problem. And I love Kenneth and we've talked about this with the XFL news writers and stuff. Love Kenneth. Seven weeks is even generous because that's assuming every player would have made it to the playoffs. Right. Right. I mean, ideally it, it should have been, you know, the contract should have been five weeks. And, and with these XFL contracts, there were so many different like incentives. Um, they had like win bonuses, they had playoff bonuses. Uh, you know, it was very incentive structured. Like the, the base salary was only like a thousand eighty dollars or something a week. Right. So Kenneth kind of got all these guys really excited and they're like, Oh, well, we're going to get, you know, seven weeks times. Like we're going to get 14 grand a piece. Like that's a ton of money. Like we're going to get all this money and, and it's going to be great. So because the XFL paid them through the end of the bankruptcy, all basically like all that other time then afterward doesn't matter. Like if they hadn't paid them for those last couple of weeks, they yeah. would have, then they would have been like entitled to more. So because of that, they are looked at as a non-priority case. So like a priority case 
to be getting money back from the bankruptcy, I would imagine would be like, um, let's say uh, CenturyLink, Lumen Field still needed some money or whatever, right? I'm just making up. Right. Or the Roughnecks, whatever. Like maybe that would have been considered more of a priority case. So because I'm like going back and forth, <laughs> sorry, but are you following me? You're following. Me. Yeah, yeah. I know so, what that works. So, because I'm getting a lot of questions about this. So because they are not a priority case, now that they're actually getting paid out, there's not enough money left in the bankruptcy fund to, to remake everybody whole. So that's why they're only getting that like eight to 12%. And it's only going to be like, you know, $500 a person or whatever. I have the number somewhere here. So it, it, it's a, it's a mess of things. And, and, and again, I love Kenneth and I get all that, but I do feel like it started with setting those bonuses and incentives aside. No one ever should have expected seven weeks of base pay, knowing that not everyone was going to make it to the playoff. Or well, I guess, I guess they, I guess eight teams. I, uh, okay, I guess maybe then they would have the base pay for the for the playoffs, but not. It just it set a really unrealistic expectation that they were all going to get this fourteen fifteen thousand. And apparently, Kenneth, when he was talking with Daniel to give these quotes and stuff, kind of thought he was talking to an agent or something. Like didn't even really realize. Anyway, so so it's really a mess. There's a lot of questions about it, but uh, that's when you see these. You know, the players thought they would be getting like seven thousand two hundred eighty, which was that you know a thousand whatever a week times seven weeks. But it's only going to be five eighty to seven fifty. But that's that's for time. That's like a bonus. They still got paid for that first five, six weeks. Does that all make sense? It does make sense. And, and basically now it's like a situation where it's kind of, it's kind of a double edged sword because like, if you hadn't gotten paid, you would be getting, you would be a higher priority now, but since you got paid and you're like, well, I got paid, but now you're, you're falling down the list of priorities where other, t- other things are, are getting 75 to 80% of what's left in that bankruptcy fund. And you're getting the 8%. And it's, it's really unfortunate. I'm not sure Maybe, uh, you know, I don't know if Kenneth was maliciously leading people. I, I would assume not because he's a player. He's looking out for the players. And maybe it was just someone who, who like explained it to him incorrectly. Maybe that's, that's the, that's what I'm talking it up to. Yeah. So this was interesting. So, so uh, Josh Davis has a tremendous article up on news up. He goes into all these numbers. He has the screenshots of all the different documents. So Josh really did. Uh, everyone could, I, Mark Perry was like, Josh did a tremendous job with this. Uh, so this was a quote from Josh. He he wrote to me. He goes, "There's no way the decision to pay them until the end of the bankruptcy, you know, prior you know, from the end of the season to the bankruptcy, wasn't on purpose. Because had they stopped after week five, they'd be a priority. But by law, by law, they'd be at a hundred percent of what was left on their deal, which went through May thirty first. That mm-hmm. would have been what you know." Seven to twelve, I, you know, I think it was more like you know, seven to ten thousand per player. Uh, four hundred players, you know, that'd be like four million dollars, right? So like that extra week or two that they paid got them out of, I mean, they would have owed like four or five million, you know, however you do the math on that, but it saved them a ton of money. But anyway, that's the big like XFL thing, all this craziness, but I just, it's, it's hard to, to wrap your head around. It helps reading Josh's article, XFL news sub, seeing all those documents and the screenshots. And I tried to spend last night kind of going through and making that as concise as I could. Uh, That kind of makes sense. If you think about it, it's like, damn, you know? There was no winning situation. Either you could have gone without the pay and then have to wait to the end of this year to get your back pay or get those two weeks, the three weeks or whatever that was left, and then be like, oh, well, now, crap, I don't get that much more. And you're, you're kind of more out money than anything, if, you, if, if, if we're looking at it correctly. And this is, yeah. And this is more kind of a nation on like how bankruptcy works and like the XFL. I mean, like, you know, this is just, no one's ever made whole with the bankruptcy. Like no one ever gets a hundred percent of their claim. So even like that alone that they would have got, they never would have got like a hundred percent of what they were owed. So I think setting those unrealistic expectations. He also, Kenneth also had a quote talking about how uh, they think that Brian and the USFL, they're going to be keeping an eye on him because of obviously, you know, where he doesn't pay the players now, what are they doing? And that he thinks they're going to take a huge chunk of the spring league players into the USFL, which we already kind of knew, but it was just interesting. I thought uh, a quote from Kenneth on that. That's going to be, that's, that I, you know, again, um, we've talked to other people who have been involved in the USFL. They have their concerns, about, you know, we discussed it less than a year ago, the the food situation at the Spring League and stuff like that. And now, you know, here are more concerns. So 
it's going to be interesting to see if uh, if if uh, they they keep on it and pay their players. Yeah, do, you, do we want to, do we want to talk about this Oreo thing? I didn't know if you had I any. This was amazing. I thought this was amazing. By the way, this is like this was incredible. Like I saw it, I was like, oh wow, that's really freaking cool. So I'll I'll put a reminder here. To, I'm going to put this on the video. Uh, uh, Shay Ross of the Elks, right? He was doing this backflip, dunking the thing. <laughs> this guy, I, I I feel like I got yelled at for talking on Twitter about this. Did you see? I, I mean. I Am I wrong? The, the idea was was that this went viral. This guy doing the backflip got like half a million views, all this stuff. And then there was all these talk like, well, this is, how, you know, see, we need to be doing viral stuff. We need to be promoting the players. And we had a quote from Naylor, Dave Naylor. He goes, yes, if there were 500 guys in the league who could perform stunts like this, it would be easy to market the players. And my immediate thing to Dave was think of, do you think Marshawn Lynch can do a backflip and dunk into like, you don't need, I mean, yes, it helps to do. He's not saying stuff exactly like this, but, you know, superhuman feats of athleticism caught on video. Maybe that's what he means. Well, I just I think that yeah, 500 players backflipping and dunking an Oreo. That's the first time I've ever seen it in my life, to be honest with you. But do you get what I'm saying? That Like we don't we can't rely on viral moments as a way to like, well, that's the only way we can promote the players is they do weird crap that we can post on TikTok. Viral videos you don't ever know what's going to go viral until it goes viral. For example, like that, that I, I hate to pump my Twitter here, but that Joaquin Phoenix video of him coming into my Joker screening, I didn't think that would go viral. I just posted a video of Joaquin Phoenix coming into the, coming into the theater and talking about Joker that got 1.6 million views in a week. So you can't like, you can't just go, Oh, this video is definitely going to be viral. It's going to definitely be viral. I just, I don't, I don't I like, Talk to Juju Smith Schuster about like how how did you know going viral on TikTok work? You know, he got he got tackled out of his shoes, right? I mean, some of these guys, I just you know, and then we had all this stuff, and, and Hodge was talking, you know, we they don't even need to be football oriented. But you don't even a clip of this guy, you know, they're talking, trying to get I don't know. I just feel like the CFL's like, um, like they're just oh yeah that would be cool like they see like oh we should do that oh we should do that. oh single game sports betting we should do that oh viral videos like oh we should do that and I just feel like who at the CFL is going to be I mean unless you're going to hire Braden or someone to like run this stuff and I think Braden worked there and got let go or whatever you know I mean I know there's history there so like I just it just feels like another like oh yeah we should do that yeah yeah and like. I don't know. Focus on the football. Figure it out. And get a video game, too, while we're at it. And get a video game. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> what do you know? Uh, BC Lions have filed a trademark for a new logo design. The Canadian Football Club, uh, Canadian Football League Club, has created a BC design and completed the application on June, June 1st. It has to be accepted by the trademarks office, um, but it's not yet assigned to an examiner. I would assume that they'd have to clear that through the CFL as well. Yeah, well, this is. Remember when I uh, wasn't? I think it was Jason Greger was on, and he was like, "BC Lions, their logos." One of our guests that we had was like, "The BC Lions have had the same logo for a million years." I'm like, "Well, here you go. They just they, no, maybe they're going to change it up." Maybe, Speaking of changing things up, maybe the BC uh, Lions were listening to our podcast. Maybe, maybe, maybe Jim, possibly, maybe Jim, Long possibly, got them there. Anyway. maybe Jim like said, maybe Jim or uh, doesn't Farhan live out in that direction yeah. in BC? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, maybe you know, maybe they kind of encouraged the change. I don't know. Uh, speaking of changes, uh, the uh, USPTO, P Patent and Trademark Office here in the United States, has uh, issued an initial refusal of the trademark application for the Washington football team. Did you know this? What? Did you know this? I did not know this. Well, we, Interesting. Yeah, this is important because obviously Taylor Heineke, XFL player, plays and we keep an eye on Washington football. I am a Washington football fan. That is going to be my team I'm cheering for this year. But yeah, they, they, that is the team name it should be. Right, but I think you know, there's a Washington Football Club, and that's get, got, you know. But get this: it's a guy. He this this Philip McCauley McCauley. He when they were coming up with the team name, he went through and picked up all these other trademarks. So now he owns. So, so do you think they're gonna like pay him out for that? That's probably what he did. I mean, back in the day, back in the day. Uh, when the internet first started, people were buying up domain names like Lego.com and then they were selling it back to Lego. You know, granted, Lego probably could have gone to court and, and you know, 
paid a little bit more going to court to grab it. But you know, there were people buying domain names and reselling them and making a lot of money. So it seems like uh, Mr. McCauley did the same thing here. I I think it should. I don't want it to be like the Washington Warriors or the Washington Runners or like. I think it should be the Washington Football Team. I like that. I like WFT. I like that. But anyway, I just thought that that was just my little Washington football note today because yeah. I think they have to get a team name, man. I think they have to really get a team name. That's you're you're losing so much money on like not having a mascot on the side of your helmet. You are. You really are. You really are. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I think it's going to happen. I think you got 32 teams. I think one can just be, you know, think like we'll Sounders FC football timbers. The, but, okay. Okay. But soccer is a whole different beast. You can't compare the two. You really can't compare the right. two. Sorry. Anyway, All right. Yeah. going to take another break. Jackson Leonard's coming up next to talk to Reed about uh, spring league and uh, stuff like that. More. And then we got <laughs> spring league and we got some fan control football news. Be excited. More fan control football news. Stay tuned for that. Well, Jackson, thank you so much for coming on. First and foremost, because obviously, you know, you you listen to the show, we correspond online, but also I thought this was great. I love talking to players. I love talking to players that have been part of the Spring League. Why don't you first off just tell us a little bit about who you are and kind of your background? I was spending the morning kind of looking up stuff. Uh, former Spring League, you did both the Vegas Showcase and then you did the one in the Alamo, San Antonio Alamo Dome thing back in November. All right. Well, thanks first for having me, Reed. Um, I'm going to crack it off. I don't have a Zoa here. I looked in the in the supermarket. They had bangs, so something to keep it going. <laughs> Stay to the tradition. Uh, so, Jackson, you know you're you're someone that's you know not unlike a lot of these players, right? You know, you grow up. You know, you you said you were playing hockey, football, uh, interested in all this stuff, uh, and it just didn't seem like you know we talk all the time about the you know the NFL and people go, who needs all football? Who needs spring league? Who needs the CFL, XFL? You know, the the number of people that are going to make it there, right, is not representative of the number of talent, right, and the number of people yeah. that are working towards it, right? So. So what do you think about having you know alternative football places like the Spring League, like the XFL, for players like you that maybe you know for whatever reason the circumstances just didn't work out to get you there? Yeah, I mean it's been the difference. You know, without the Spring League, I really wouldn't have had an opportunity after college, and obviously you know everything stopped once COVID happened. No CFL, um, no XFL. People were opting out of their CFL contracts to come to San Antonio. So it was a big deal. And, you know, another podcast I listened to is uh, Jeff Reinbold. Uh, he was a coach with the generals. I got some time to get to know him out there in San Antonio. And one thing he always says is there's a lot more players that could play in the national football league than that do play. And, um, you know, where we're going with, you know, I, I don't know exactly where we're going with, the USFL and this XFL CFL merger, but there's a lot more opportunity out there, you know, and there's, there's a lot of talent. There's room. People will watch the stuff, you know, they already are. We're getting what 400,000 viewers in the spring league right now. And they aren't even really marketing it. You know, it's a soft opening, you know, it's like when you open a new restaurant and you invite your friends and family, close friends and family. It's a soft opening. That's really what it was. So they're doing a great job. Um, you know, we're looking one step ahead. Brian Woods, he's brilliant. He's looking three, four steps ahead while we're looking one step ahead. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't really know where he's going. It's, it's so tough. You know, they talk like the average NFL career is like three years or something like that, right? There's whatever the statistics. And, you know, players like you and we, you know, I talk with a lot of guys on the podcast, off the podcast, you know, this all this time with COVID going through XFL being shut down, all these things like, you know, this is a lot of your players' careers or opportunities, right? Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, the, it's a small window and the clock's ticking. Well, exactly. You know, and, and just today, you know, as we record, you know, like five or six CFL retirements came out today, you know, because these players have been off for 16 months. I mean, that's a monumental amount. You know, talk about that just as as an athlete, as someone, you know, you've trained just how much time that 16 months off now, what that really feels like to players like you. 
I guess the 16 months off, I mean, the spring league was the difference for me. I mean, if I can touch on, you know, in Las Vegas, I got to develop a little bit with Donnie Henderson. And I, I, are you familiar with Donnie Henderson? A little bit. Okay. So uh, former DC for the New York Jets, position coach for many teams, you know, the Bills, Ravens, Cardinals. He talked about how um, he got three guys gold jackets. Um, he was the defensive backs coach when they drafted Ed Reed with the Ravens. Um, he worked with Ty law who also got a gold jacket and he was the DB coach with the bills. When Stefan Gilmore got his train, went on to get his $65 million contract with the Patriots and helped develop him a lot. And so just being able to go out there for a couple weeks, be in the film room and then get the reps. And it's just, and you know, they're better reps than I've ever gotten before. You know, day one, you're out there. I'm Zach Mettenberger's across from me playing quarterback. And, um, you know, I'm from division three. So that, that, you know, that's a big step for me. I had a pass breakup against him day one. Um, when I talk about, uh, Paul Dawson, my first day in the spring league, we get on the bus, you know, we're staying at on Boulder highway in the outskirts of Las Vegas and they shuttle us on buses every day to Sam Boyd. So you got this 20 minute bus ride out into the desert to this huge stadium. And first day I, I get on there early, make sure I got my seat and no one's sitting next to me. Cool. Got my headphones in getting ready. And last person to get on the bus, this big, rugged, bald headed man. And he comes up to my seat and he says, move over. He's got a Bengal sweatshirt across his chest. So I moved over and I asked him, you know, Hey, Bengals, uh, you play for them. He's like, he started telling me a story. Paul Dawson was the number one linebacker in the country out of TCU was supposed to get drafted in the first round, had off the field issues, didn't end up going till the third round. Was a backup for Vontae's perfect for three years. Um, and then, he, you know, was playing a lot of special teams, got released. And, you know, on day one, he was just like, hey, you know, you're, you're probably nervous, but this is just football. Just come out here and do your thing. So um, that along with, you know, it, um, going to San Antonio, another chance to get some reps, some opportunities. I think one of the big things that helped me out there was being in that film room with Jerry Glanville, um, coach Fuller, um, you know, he, he's the head coach for the Jacksonville sharks, but, um, he came to, you know, just connect just like a lot of times those coaches are there for the same reasons as players sometimes, you know, to make connections, move on, move up, whatever it is, or to find some players and bring them back to the national arena league. So, um, they were running cover four and I, he told me that, and I had, I got in late. So I had to learn things on the fly. And first thing coach Fuller says, take everything you know about cover four and throw it out the window. I'm like, what? So they were doing this type of defense where uh, they, they were bracketing receivers. They could pick uh, any top receiver. They could move it around in the defense, whether it was the slot, a tight end, whatever they wanted to bracket uh, in double coverage, but it changed a lot of rules and just going from that, you know, small school playbook to uh, an NFL defense. That was the difference. You know, you, like I was taking reps in the slot against Nick Holly, you know, he was a star in the XFL um, competing. I got film of breakups against him, but you know, at that level, once you got to try out and make a team. Everyone's talented. It's the mental aspect that came into play and that'll just be huge going forward. You know, um, as far as preparing, you know, when we're in a time where opportunities are limited and it looks like in, on the horizon, you look over the hill, things are going to be starting up, you know, just being ready, knowing what you have to be ready for mentally. Um, what was your experiences like with Brian and working with him both in Vegas and then in uh, San Antonio? Yeah. So, um, I didn't really talk to Brian 
much at all in Las Vegas. The only thing I did was at the very end of camp after the second game, I made sure I went to every single coach and thanked them for the time. And I went to Brian and just thanked him. I literally told him this was the best week of my life because it was, you know, um, being from a division three school, I had never played or competed in a stadium like that. I mean, no, we didn't have fans. No, there weren't people there. There were scouts there. It was awesome. We had Raiders scouts there, Bear scouts. Um, the Calgary Stampeder scout was there every single day, every single day. Um, just was extremely thankful. And um, moving forward to San Antonio, so – I come in on that practice squad. Right. And so my first interaction with him is check in and he kind of explains, you know, how things are working. The practice squad guys, we're going to be going at 7 a.m. First of four practices of the day. Right. Because two teams would practice. There was at the time there were six teams. So the generals and alphas would practice after that. Um, and then the Conquerors and someone else, and then the Aviators and Blues at night. So um, just got talked to him briefly, and then I didn't initially get picked up after the showcase. Um, although on day two, I really balled out. I, got, I was the first kid in the whole showcase to get a pick. Um, strapped up some receivers after that on day two. Showed out on day three. Um, just didn't get picked up, you know? And, um, it seemed like the showcase was primarily wide receivers and D beats. They had, they had the O line and D line picked out, you know, for the most part. Um, so it was, you know, like 40 minutes of just position drills on air, jumping up high point football, seeing your breaks, seeing you flip your hips every way. And once you were dog tired, 40 minutes in, okay, it's time for one-on-ones, you know, who's, who can compete when they're tired. And I thought that was actually a great setup for what it was. I know it wasn't what kids were expecting it to be, but the opportunity also changed at first when we got accept, when I got accepted this thing, they didn't have a Fox sports deal. It was going to be in Las Vegas again. So there were conflicting schedules at the Alamo dome. That's another thing that I don't think people realize is how much Brian Woods was dealing with, with the manager of the Alamo dome who begged him to come to San Antonio and then was kind of giving him a hard time about certain things. You know, there was, there was a high school games on Friday nights, um, university of San university of Texas, San Antonio had a game on Saturday. So it seemed like every night the aviators and blues would have to practice at that high school field, which was fine. It was just a nice, Texas high school field, uh, turf field, but just, you know, it it seemed like it was, you know, he knew he was going into a COVID season. You didn't have everything planned out. He said, Hey, we're going to make it work. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, he had tremendous, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? He just had a lot of balls to do what he did. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you you played with the Conquerors, right, in the Spring League with uh, with Coach Glanville. What what's he like? What did you learn under Coach Glanville? Coach Glanville is a man of God. Um, you know, he would read us something from the Bible every day. Um, he doesn't get mad. Maybe he was a little crazier when he was younger, but coaching in the Spring League. He doesn't get mad. He's very calm. He had a great sense of humor um, and was just really knowledgeable in the film sessions. Um, For the most part, you know, it seemed like the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator were running practice. He kind of was just, you know, how like a lot of head coaches do They, you know, they're just kind of watching and, you know, coming in when they, when they need to, to address things. But, um, Man, just realizing because because they announced the spring league announced on Instagram who all these coaches were, but we only found out about the head coaches. So I didn't necessarily know who everyone was when I first got there. But just in hindsight, the research I've done, like I was playing 
for Jerry Glanville, who coached Dion Sanders for three years in Atlanta when De- when Dion was fresh in the NFL. And, you know, I didn't, I knew that like, when you looked him up, it seemed like most of his height came from the Houston Oilers. But the more I did research and just realized I was actually playing for the head coach of my idol, you know, it's crazy. What do you make of all this USFL stuff now with Brian and the relaunch? I mean, it's funny to me, you know, he was on prior to this spring league season, kind of outlined a lot of this, right? Kind of said, Hey, you know, we're going to do this with the hub cities and build, you know, then obviously the announcements come out. A lot of people think, Oh, um, you know, they're going to eight cities next year or they're going to 10 cities. And I go, well, you know, I think it's going to be somewhere in between, right? What, what do you make of all this USFL stuff? I think, um, I think he, he, he's got the best, you know, shot. Like, I mean, he's got the grassroots. He knows who everyone who wants to play football, everyone who's ever played in the spring league. He, he knows everyone, you know, you try to compare it to this XFL CFL merger. I, I, I get that the rock and, uh, Danny Garcia, they got the money and stuff, but Brian Woods has been in the trenches. He's, he's been doing this. He's, he's been dealing with, you know, so many things thrown at him. For example, you know, I was following him around a little bit in between the showcase and getting picked up by a team. I mean, the calls from coaches, you know, Hey, Brian, I haven't gotten my check yet. Well, hey, coach, I mean, you were on the Jousters, the last team to be assembled. The bank won't write you your check yet because they haven't processed your W-2. Stuff that makes perfect sense. You know, when you start a new job, a lot of times you don't get that paycheck till the end of the second week. Um, Meanwhile, five minutes later, the rink manager wants to have a fight with Brian Woods about schedules. Um, He's getting phone calls left and right. There's just so many things that he's the perfect one to deal with. And he never bats an eye. He never bats an eyelash, you know, he, straight faced. I mean, he just takes it all on. And uh, are you in terms of potential future playing? Are you, are you, are we kind of transitioning out of football? Are you looking at something like the USFL to you know continue or yeah. you for more spring league? What are you, what are you looking for? I'd like to get back into the spring league. I, I just, I love playing there. Obviously I'd love an opportunity in the CFL, maybe to play with my brother, Sherrod Baltimore, uh, up in Ottawa. And I have, uh, some scouts that, uh, you know, follow me, keep tabs on me on, uh, Instagram, my workouts and stuff. Um, but, um, I, I went to a showcase actually called, uh, with an agency called black diamond, um, in March. And, after that, I was planning on uh, going to um, the the ANC that the Spring League was doing, and I actually ended up in one on ones down there, laying out for a ball with a receiver, and um, we hit the goalpost, and the goalpost didn't have a pad on it, and so I got a bone bruise on my shin, and I didn't. I, I, I played the rest of the showcase on heart. You know, I, I just finished it. You know, I, it didn't stop me from running and stuff, but then the ANC was the next week after that. And I just, you know, like, I was like, they have tabs on me. I got a player grade at the showcase. I've already been on a roster. If I don't think I'm going to run well right now because of this bone bruise, maybe I should just heal up and see if I get an opportunity. And I have like numbers for over half the head coaches in the spring league. Like I was in contact with them. Um, I've actually talked to coach Fuller about, um, you know, he had some guys get injured week one with the Sharks. So um, going to get some opportunity, just getting some reps, some more time to develop in either the now or, um, possibly with the Massachusetts pirates. They have a talented roster down there um, in Massachusetts. Actually, almost all those guys have former NFL experience. So hopefully just um, catch on with an Al team or an IFL team. Um, 
If not, you know, maybe the USL, USFL will be popping up with some showcases or the spring league, you know, they utilize the spring league. Like I think we talked about in the emails um, and I'll be ready to go just to come out and compete. That sounds good. Uh, well, you've been so gracious with your time today. I, I really appreciate, you know, the interactions we've had back and forth online and just, you know, uh, obviously sharing your story and, and hearing more players, you know, benefiting from, you know, these alternate football things. Uh, Jackson, thank you so much for taking your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Reed. Um, looking forward to more episodes and, uh, you know, things opening up again with COVID. So, uh, interesting content and um, wish you guys the best. Awesome. Thanks, man. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you, Jackson. That was, I appreciate him too. You know, again, uh, if you're a, like a spring league player, you know, reach out. I'll, well, that's fine. I, I, I work from home. I do. I interview random wedding vendors all the time for my other podcast. So I can you, interview random spring league players. <laughs> It's over now. Spring League is over now. You don't have to go through your media contacts to get a hold of us. You didn't have to do that before, but well. Oh, I got a rant here in a second. Yeah. Well, we'll leave, we'll leave it a go. Uh, Conqueror's wide receiver and 2021 co-leader in the Spring League and receptions, Michael Bandy, has signed with the Chargers. Uh, he was at the Conquerors in uh, 2020 and 2021. So congrats to him for getting on an NFL squad. Yeah, congrats. Uh, we had the big mega bowl. Uh, you know, obviously Lyman won. Uh, I had to work, so sorry. It was a, a, t- a tremendous game that, you know, Luis Perez threw a game ending interception, like the six yard line. It was a very tremendous game. Uh, congrats to Stan. You know, Cole Boozer's no longer on. He's on his way up to the Alouettes. But uh, Ryan Willis was the QB uh, uh, MVP. You know, R- Ryan Willis with, with the lineman. He played the whole year under Hal Mummy. Here's my problem. Right after the Spring League and the Mega Bowl came out, uh, Spring League email, they go, hey, like here's the press release, all this stuff. If you want to talk to Brian Woods, CEO, Hal Mummy, or Ryan Willis, let us know. We'll set it up. I go, perfect. We'll talk to Ryan later. That's fine. I go, I would really, we'd really like to obviously talk to Brian Woods again, a friend of the show. And then we'd like to talk to Coach Mummy. That would be great. Perfect. No problem. You know, email. So that was Saturday. Email Monday, nothing. Email Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Brian's not doing any interviews. Not just you. He's not doing any interviews. I'm working on Coach Mummy. Perfect. Okay. I go, we all, you know, then we'd also like, can we get Ryan Willis instead then? Because, I, you know, I didn't want to be greedy and ask for all three. It's still nothing. You know, we're, we're Thursday here. I'm like, guys, if you're going to offer media availability, then do it or just don't offer it. Like, don't offer it then. I don't care. But I emailed you guys four times about it. Don't put it out there. And he's like, yeah, sorry for the confusion of Brian's. I'm like, okay, well, the press release said, if you would like to talk to Brian Woods, please do whatever. That's my whole problem with the Spring League this year. And if it's going to be the same thing with the USFL, I'm really getting tired of it already because, you know, we have, uh, our listeners would have loved to hear from Coach Mummy. You know, XFL mm-hmm. guy, we don't even need to talk about that. Talk about the Spring League, talk about all this stuff. But um, anyway, just infuriating. Uh, but that's why we have no Spring League. We have Jackson Leonard. Thankfully, he came on. But yeah, they uh, waste our time with this. Like, it's crazy. I, you know, like, it's just, it's, it's, we, we've had our, like, we've had our criticisms of the fan control football, but at the same time, like their media representatives have been completely open. I just don't understand why there's so much, I guess, unwillingness to deal with the media. And I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Like if it weren't for us covering these things, I don't know if people would really know about these things as much as they do. Granted, there would still be people that would know about it, but their marketing has not been the best and their openness and transparency hasn't been the best. And I don't know why that is. And maybe it's because Brian was worried about someone leaking something about the USFL. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I don't care to speculate, but I would, I would hope that once this USFL thing uh, comes into play, barring any, you know, copyright issues that might arise in the courts coming up soon, uh, with trademarks and whatnot, I would hope that Brian would not be as closed down as he's been with the spring league. I would hope. And I, you know, maybe that's the situation with how the spring league fell apart, you know, six months ago, maybe that's the reason why they've been so tight lipped. I don't know. I, 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 I'd like to get some answers though. I just don't get it. Like, I tell me how many like media, how many people do you really think reach out? They're like, Oh, we want to talk to how mommy after the spring league. 
I mean, a, a handful. I know. I, I mean, I would love to talk to. I mean, our people. I'm not saying it's not, but like, how many media outlets really were like, we would like to talk to Coach Mummy or Ryan Willis after the spring league. I would love to talk to all of them, but I'm just saying, like, I can't imagine that like NBC Sports is like you know blowing the door off or like the Athletic or the Ra- I don't know who these whatever people are like. We right. got to talk with you. We got to get Coach Mummy on right now. It's crazy. Definitely. Of course, uh, they they got they uh, they got four hundred eighteen thousand viewers for the Mega Bowl. Uh, that uh, that pulls their average to about four hundred eight thousand viewers per week on Fox. So uh, decent numbers. Can't complain about that. People aren't really watching. You know, I think I think that's the thing that's the problem with with ratings numbers that people watch TV differently now. Yeah. Like they watch it on their phones or they record it and watch it later. I mean, you know, you're saying 408,000 a week, but it could be, you know, it could be upwards of 700,000. You know, you never really know. And these numbers aren't really that accurate. So <laughs> speaking of inaccurate numbers, zing, um, the FCF is uh, expanding from four teams to eight teams in 2.0. And that was mentioned by Patrick Bees. Yeah, they, he had said it was going to be six. I guess this is in the Qatar <laughs> Economic Forum. He was appearing, Cutter. I think, via Zoom. Uh, uh, talking about, what is it? Did I say it wrong? I think it's Cutter. I think it's pronounced Cutter. Q U A T A R. He was on the uh, Qatar Economic Forum talking about the future of digital sports. It was supposed to be six teams. Now it's eight. People seem really excited. It's uh, almost July, and they're kicking off in August. So let's let's, let's do see. it. <laughs> let's see what's going on. Speaking of Cutter, they uh, recently announced that if you are not vaccinated, you can't go to the World Cup. Um, I still can't believe they're holding a World Cup there. It's going to be really flipping hot. It's going to be really flipping hot yeah that's crazy so that's all i got today paul uh, i have one note before we go i was gonna mention at the top of the show uh i might do okay if we want l i'm not a big elf guy the european league of football i it's really hard to cover people <laughs> watching on youtube and stuff if you want elf coverage leave a comment on the youtube video say Re, we want elf coverage i'll do like i'll bring on vince from alt football or i'll bring on josh or someone i'll do that paul i won't Board, you know, burden with it with the elf coverage. But if you really want elf, you got to drive that YouTube algorithm. So comment on the video, say we want elf coverage, and we will see what we can do with that. I also saw that you deleted the thing about the NCAA. Did you uh, want to congrats. talk about that? I was trying not to hold you too long. C- congrats to the uh, the athletes who you know they've won a little bit of uh, something there. They've won a little bit of a win in the Supreme Court by uh, you know the the idea of that getting more than uh, getting more than what they're owed basically from their colleges. So we want to congratulate uh, the athletes on a big win. They could have gone a little bit further, but uh, now it's going to be interesting to see how, how players are going to start making more money when your colleges are basically making billions of dollars off your image. And the NCAA has been corrupt for a long time. And, you know, I've, I've stood by that and I'm glad now, um, of course, what started this whole mess was you went and picked up an NCAA uh, basketball game. For example, specifically the, the episode that I'm talking about is you pick up these NCAA games on from EA Sports and you pay, play these uh, historic recreations. Like, can you duplicate UCLA's comeback in such and such year? And I'm saying UCLA because what would happen is you would play as UCLA and you would be small forward number 31. I believe that was his number. I'm completely, uh, completely, you know, draw, uh, picking at straws here. But let me let me double check and make sure. Um, he was 31. He play as a uh, UCLA player number 31, and it would have all of all of someone's stats, specifically height, weight, so and so. But it would say uh, small forward number 31. And Ed O'Bannon was like, "That's me." Even though you're not using my name, you're using yeah. every single one of my stats. You're still using my likeness. So Ed O'Bannon sued, and. They won, and then EA pulled all their NCAA products off the table because they didn't know how to pay the athletes for using their likenesses. And, you know, like I've talked about it numerous times here where it's like, like when I used to work in Tucson, you'd go to the stadium and, and buy a jersey that would say Arizona. It was like an Arizona football jersey. The name wasn't on the back, but the number was on the back. And you're like, well, I know I'm buying Willie Tui Thomas number. Even though I'm not buying the name on the back, I'm buying the number that that represents his likeness. So it's it's a big win, and I'm hoping that, you know, this leads to this this phony amateurism going out the door and these players really making some money. So I'm 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 glad on that. I'm gonna end my rant there. That's good. Uh Josh McGee, friend of the show, he was on Argos fan. He just sent me a list. I'll tell you, 
like and subscribe. We got that. It sounds like we got a good giveaway coming up. He just messaged me stuff. He's mailing you a package. And I think we are going to have uh, maybe some stuff for you, but then also I think we'll have plenty. It sounds like we'll have plenty of stuff for giveaways. So uh, please like and subscribe if you are a Marcas fan or a um, an Argos fan. Sounds like we got, I, I tell you, tremendous stuff coming up. So be excited about that. Looking forward to the treasure trove heading my way, I guess. It's heading my direction yeah. for once instead of yours. Interesting. Want to thank everybody for tuning in. Of course, please like, subscribe to the video, uh, get notifications as well. Please hit that bell, get the notifications. Can't say that enough. And of course, Reed, you know, works a bunch of time on this. This uh, works works a bunch of hours on this podcast. So again, uh, head over to our offers page, and you know, buy a razor for Manscaped. Can't say that enough. The code is Markcast. You get twenty percent off free shipping. Why not? Why not? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thanks.